Warning, this story contains scenes and scenarios that may be disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is the sixth entry in the On the Trail of the Vampire universe. All previous entries can be found in the description below. Thank you for listening, and thank you once again, Skiller, for allowing me to bring your story to life. Now, let's delve into the dark together. Blood, the very essence of life. Its symbolism pervades all our cultures and all our beliefs. We use phrases like lifeblood to highlight the importance that blood is to life. Thousands of years before scientists even began to understand the complex and extraordinary life-sustaining properties of blood, the Bible in the book of Leviticus informed us that the life of every creature is in its blood. In ancient Israel, Blood was not only a metaphor or symbol for life, it was equivalence to life itself. In most occurrences where blood was shed in scripture, it meant that life had ended. To remove the blood was to terminate life. As such, while blood symbolizes life, it is also used as a symbol of death. This is most often when one sees the spilling of blood. Blood spilling from a body into an ever-growing pool symbolizes the losing of one's life force. Beyond these basics, blood carries many other connotations in our lives and culture. Blood symbolizes guilt. We often use the term blood is on your hands as a way to signify someone's misdeeds of a grave or serious character from the moral and social points of view. This stems right back to the Bible where the term blood on his head is often used to refer to one's guilt. Blood often symbolizes a solemn agreement. Blood oaths have for centuries been a way to make solemn agreements between people. They usually involve two people cutting themselves on their palms and shaking hands, thereby sharing blood to seal an agreement. Similarly, we know the term blood brothers, when two or more men not related by birth swear loyalty to one another, often with a ceremonial mingling of blood, or have a common bond built by facing war or adversity together. Indeed, blood is used as a sign of brotherhood. When two people go to war together, we often say they spilled blood together. Blood denotes family. We often call someone in our family our blood, and in fact this is in many ways scientifically accurate. We share common DNA with our families, that means the substance inside of us has shared traits and characteristics. But it's mostly used as a symbolic term to explain how family members are cut from the same cloth as us. We are most similar to them. Often we will employ terms like blood is thicker than water as a symbolic phrase to highlight that blood, our family, is more important than friends. Water. We also often see blood as being something that's your essence. If there's something that is so core to your sense of your identity or your beliefs, you could say that it's in my blood. For example, an athlete may be asked why they are so good at sports, and they might just say, it's in my blood. Here it means that it's the way they are, and they were born that way. Blood also denotes sacrifice. In Christianity, it's believed Jesus died as a sacrifice for our sins. His death was what enabled everyday repentant Christians to make it into heaven. Jesus talked of spilling his blood so that us humans may have eternal life. Furthermore, many Christians drink wine that is blessed and believed to be turned into the blood of Christ. By drinking his blessed blood, Christians believe themselves to be blessed by God and forgiven of their sins. And even before the death of Christ, the Jewish law required regular blood sacrifice offerings on behalf of sins. Because of this, God chose to use a blood sacrifice as part of the sacrificial system of the Jewish people. Each time blood was shed, it reminded the people of life and death. Most commonly, 
Lambs were killed as sacrificial gifts to God, as a sign of love and devotion. For the Jews who rejected Jesus as their Messiah, animal sacrifices done in obedience to the Old Testament covenants were only stopped in 70 AD at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Second Temple by the armies of Rome. In many other religions, blood is still often spilled as a sign of sacrifice to the god or gods. Basic to both animal and human sacrifice is the recognition of blood as the sacred life force in man and beast. Through the sacrifice, through the return of the sacred life revealed in the victim, the god lives, and therefore man and nature live. The great potency of blood has been utilized through sacrifice for a number of purposes, earth fertility, purification, and expiation. Of course, of all the worldly manifestations of the life force, human blood undoubtedly impressed men as the most valued and thus the most potent and efficacious as an oblation. The occurrence of human sacrifice was actually widespread in ancient times, and its intentions various, ranging from communion with a god and participation in his divine life to expiation and the promotion of the earth's fertility. Interestingly, it was more commonly adopted by agricultural societies rather than by hunting or pastoral peoples. In Mexico, the belief that the sun needed human nourishment led to sacrifices in which as many as 20,000 victims perished annually in the Aztec and Nahua calendrical maze ritual in the 14th century AD. In 1487, the Great Templo Mayor was dedicated in the main Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, with a four-day celebration. Some historians put the figure as high as 80,000 people sacrificed during those four days. In one shape or form, all civilizations throughout history have ritualized the importance of blood. With the creation of the modern nation-state, countries began to use flags or colors to show their reverence for their people's sacrifice in war, revolution, or in a struggle of some sort, such as for independence and it is the color red, visibly a strong, bold color, that is used on many national flags today to symbolize the country's blood, power, courage, strength, and valor. Indeed, red is the most used color on flags and military insignia throughout the world. As I stood in the shattered living room of the Grant family home, staring in sadness at the bloodless, empty husks that once were Paul and Lynn Grant, I couldn't help but remember that, in the end, blood is the common denominator among all of us. Yet most people don't understand it, nor do they really want to. Many people, if they're lucky, will never see much of their own blood in their lifetimes, Maybe at the most from a small cut or a nosebleed. You could take a poll and you'd probably find out that very few people realize that 7% of their body weight is from blood alone. Or that the average human body that weighs between 150 and 180 pounds has between 1.2 and 1.5 gallons of blood. That is equivalent to roughly 10 to 12 pints of blood. Did you know that the amount of blood lost before someone becomes unconscious is only about two pints? If you lose more than 40% of your blood, you will die. That is about 2,000 milliliters, 0 0.053 gallons, or 4.24 pints of blood. That's a scary thought. Worse yet, that a mortis vampire can consume that much blood in one attack. The old Dracula movies were complete bullshit. When showing Bela Lugosi or Christopher Lee coming back night after night to slowly drain the blood from their female conquests, vampires have no such self-control. They are at the level of the beast, simple killing machines that are driven by only one consuming need. To kill and feed. Four pints of blood is nothing to a ravenous vampire. They can drain this amount within a few minutes, usually feeding from the jugular vein, which allows for a slower, controlled drain of the victim's blood. An arterial bite would result in huge spurts from the wound, difficult to control, and ultimately amounting to a lot of wasted blood. And a vampire does not want to waste a single drop. 
Another thing you'll never learn from the movies is that, just like with the vampire bat, the vampire has an enzyme that prevents its victim's blood from clotting. When the vampire bites its victim, it secretes this powerful clot-dissolving substance so that the victim's blood will keep flowing, allowing it to feed more efficiently. I sighed morosely as I considered those dark details, then bent down to look more closely at the ravaged and defiled bodies lying at my feet. Paul and Linda Grant, in their early forties, married for a little over twenty years, Paul, ironically, was the funeral director in this little town of Marshall, Missouri. He was lying on the carpeted floor, still dressed from his day at the funeral home, wearing a somber and tasteful black suit. He laid face up, his eyes and mouth wide open in a permanent expression of shock and horror. A moment of time captured in death, frozen the second he laid eyes on the visage of pure evil he had mistakenly invited into his home. It looked like he put up a hell of a fight, judging from the utter chaos that now lay within the room. Lamps, vases, and furniture were knocked over, smashed and scattered everywhere. Paul, of course, had tried to protect his wife, but in the end he hadn't stood a chance, not when facing the Homo Nosferatu Vampires, one of the undead. Resistance had been futile. But I doubted he was killed right away. Probably was knocked unconscious, allowing the vampire to turn immediately on the wife. You see, vampires won't kill immediately. They desire that the heart continues to pump, so that the pressure of the blood will shoot at high volume once their incisors have pierced the neck and into the jugular. It's another fallacy that vampires drink or suck their victim's blood, or that their fangs are hollow and they suck blood like through a straw. No. Instead, vampires use the victim's own body, their own pumping heart, to drain their blood expediently and efficiently. With each pump of the heart, the precious liquid shoots in a hot jet directly down the vampire's greedy gullet. As the blood pressure falls off with the dying of the heart, the anti-clotting agents in the vampire's saliva ensures the blood continues to flow unabated. In the end, the victim becomes an empty husk, weighing 7% less than when they were alive. The vampire is the perfect predator, cruel and efficient. I turned next to Linda Grant. She was lying on the couch, nude. The vampire had had his way with her before mercifully ending her life. I hoped to God that he'd finished with his vile intentions before her husband had regained consciousness. Once the wife was drained of blood, the vampire would have returned to her husband. Both had been bitten, and both would have to be destroyed. They would be turning into vampires themselves by dusk tomorrow. I pulled out a long dagger from the scabbard on my belt. Its blade was about seven or eight inches long, one side was razor sharp and curled up to a very nasty pointed tip, while the other had a wicked looking serrated edge. A wickedly designed killing implement designed specifically for both cutting and sawing. Nevertheless, it was beautifully crafted, with a bright silver blade and a handle made from high grade ivory. So exquisite, it never could be suspected of its historical significance to the preservation of mankind. On its smooth, shiny blade was the Latin inscription, Deus Lux Mea Est, meaning God is my light. More than 500 years old, the dagger was originally used by an esoteric wing of the Catholic Church, dedicated to hunting down and killing vampires. Lost to time and generations, and eventually came into my possession upon the death of my girlfriend, Bethany, herself a vampire. I took out a vial of blessed and sanctified holy water I kept in my vest and poured some of it over the blade. Then, in turn, I plunged the dagger into the hearts of both Linda and Paul, making sure to twist it several times back and forth, left to right. After withdrawing the dagger, I once again doused it with the holy water, kissed the blade, and then proceeded to saw off the heads of the hapless couple. As I did so, I incited the holy words, Ajuri te, spiritus nequeas me per diem omnipotentem. 
Latin for I adjure thee, most evil spirit, by almighty God. The serrated edge of the dagger was meant for this task, but I still found it tough going. Over the years, I discovered it was actually harder to cut through the neck of a freshly killed human than to decapitate one of the Nosferatu. The older the vampire, it seemed, the less substantial the body remained. Just as I finished the gruesome task, I heard a voice come from behind me. It was Steve, my oldest and closest friend. Jack, he said. Kenny and I found the rest of the family in one of the upstairs bedrooms. You better come take a look. Steve and I had been in this from the beginning, and he had seen a lot. But the look on his face told me that whatever was awaiting me in the other room wasn't going to be pleasant. Even his bronze surfer at hand seems to have lost some of its vigor. I nodded, stood up, and after wiping the Grant's blood off Bethany's dagger, I followed Steve upstairs. We got up to the bedroom and Steve stepped aside to let me enter. The room reeked of sweat, blood, and the musky smell of sex. I knew from our quick investigative search on the Grant family as we rolled into town that there were two teenage daughters, Megan, age 17, and Marie, 15. My God, was all I could manage as I saw the two girls lying on the bed. Their clothes lay in tatters, ripped from their bodies and exposing their young, lithe figures. They had met the same fate as their mother. Their legs were splayed, and bite marks had desecrated their most tender flesh. Their throats were torn open, and their ghostly white faces told me that they had been completely drained of blood. I heard a shaky voice from behind me. My God, Jack, the whole family didn't want enough for this sick bastard and the girls. What he did to him, Christ. I turned around and looked at Kenny Grimes, the newest member of our vampire-killing family. At 21, he was just a year older than I was when my own life turned on its head and I was forced down the rabbit hole into madness and fear. How the time had flown, I thought. With his sandy brown hair worn in the badass mullet style, made recently popular by actors Patrick Swayze, Charlie Sheen, and Rob Lowe, combined with his Appalachian rugged good looks. Kenny had a strong resemblance to the actor Richard Dean Anderson, the star of that current TV hit, MacGyver. Even after 18 months on the team, the kid was still learning learning how cruel and sadistic a mortis vampire could be. And this house of horrors had been the worst he had seen so far. I know, Kenny, I replied, touching his shoulder. With the mortis, it's not just for the blood. They get off on the violence, the sexual sadism. Your man Wojciech is on a roll. As I looked down at the remains of the two Grant girls, it was gut-wrenching to realize we had once again gotten so close to getting the Mortis vampire we knew only as Wojciech, just missing him by an hour or two. Fuck all the luck, I thought. We had been so close, yet not been soon enough to save the Grants. An entire family of four obliterated, just to appease the monster's bloodlust. Steve looked at me knowingly, and stretched out his hand. He was going to save Kenny the odious task of decapitating the girls. I sadly took out Bethany's knife and gave it to him. Kenny stood to the side, still tears in his eyes, no doubt dreading the further defiling of the young girls. But it had to be done. Just as Steve was dousing the blade in holy water, I thought I could see something stuck in the gaping mouth of the older girl. Wait, I instructed, as I bent over to take a look. Sure enough, there was something that looked like paper stuck in the girl's throat. I steeled myself, and using my fingers, reached in and pulled it out. I could see it was a rolled up piece of memo paper. It was heavily stained with the girl's bodily fluids, and it was close to disintegrating as I unrolled it. Some of the ink had run, but the message was still easy enough to read. Fuck, I muttered as I turned to look at Kenny. He saw the look in my eyes and came up alongside. I wanted to spare the kid, but I knew it would be futile. 
I hesitated for a moment, then reluctantly handed him the note. Wojciech had left him a personal message. You play a good game, boy. You fancy yourself a vampire slayer, yet you remain a simpleton. An uneducated hillbilly from cold country. A novice, a fool. The more you pursue me, the more bodies I will leave behind for you to find. Especially like these two sweet things. So young, so terribly succulent. Their blood is on your hands. Or should I say, down my throat. The note was signed simply with a W. Kenny crumpled it in his shaking hand, tightening into a fist so tight it became white. The anger and frustration on his face was palpable. Look, Kenny, I started. The prick's just trying to get under your skin. This message is actually a sign he's getting scared, getting desperate. He knows we're hot on his trail, and he has no sanctuary anymore. He has to keep moving around. He's trying to warn you off with the threats of killing more people, but he'll do it anyway, even if we leave him alone. We got him on the run. Kenny nodded, and he looked once again down at the girls' bodies. I know, Jack, he replied. You don't have to worry about me. Boy, Jack won't get under my skin that easy. I know what he's trying to do, and it's failed. After what I've seen here, I'm even more resolved than ever. He's truly a monster, a scourge of evil that must be destroyed. It's as simple as that, and I won't rest until that's done. Within the hour, I was on the roads to Kansas City. I had a flight out to LAX later in the day. Kenny and Steve stayed behind, but we all knew it was unlikely we'd get another lead on Wojciech anytime soon. He was probably already getting hunkered down in another city or town. It's the game we had to play. A lot more waiting than action. All the while knowing people were going to die in the process. Before leaving Marshall, though, I had to stop by Ridge Park Cemetery. As a history buff, I had always wanted to see the gravesite of Jim the Wonder Dog. If you don't know who I'm talking about... Jim was a lowland setter who, throughout the 1920s and 30s, was reputed to have psychic powers. He picked the winner of the Kentucky Derby seven years in a row, the Yankee victory in the 1936 World Series, correctly predicted that Franklin Roosevelt would be re-elected in 1936, and most amazingly, he could predict the sex of an unborn infant. Jim died in March 1937 at the age of 12 and since then has been a major tourist draw and icon of this small town. I laid a single rose on Jim's grave. I had always been a sucker for dogs. Late that afternoon, after my plane had taken off for the three-hour flight back to L.A., I settled back into my seat, closing my eyes in an attempt to catch some much-needed sleep. However, the horrific images of the defiled bodies of the two Grant girls kept dancing through my thoughts like a grade B horror movie playing on an endless loop, making sleep totally elusive. An hour and four beers later, I wasn't making any progress. I knew I was overdoing it, but fuck it, I thought. The stewardess was a good sport. She'd rummage through her cart and just hand me another. Maybe it was my charming personality and dashing good looks, I thought, half drunkenly to myself. But probably more likely, she just saw the haunted look in my eyes. Truth was, I was just so sick and tired of that asshole Wojciech always being one step ahead of us. And we couldn't save the innocent victims of his wanton bloodlust. He was taunting us, for sure, and getting even more sick pleasure out of doing it. And then I thought of Kenny. Really, who was I to complain? Today's carnage must have been especially terrible for him and much more personal. I sighed, closing my eyes once again. I thought back to when my partner Roxy and I first met Kenny in May of 1988, almost a year and a half previous. We were in Browersville, West Virginia, on the trail of the Mortis vampire only known as Wojciech. We had tracked him across five states, where he had left a trail of bodies. In Brewersville, a small coal mining community, Wojciech had tried to set up a sanctuary by purchasing the Barker estate, the old familial home of the Barker family, 
the town's original mine owners. Through a newspaper ad, he hired Kenny to be the caretaker and groundskeeper. By the time we got there, Wojciech had abducted and turned a 21-year-old Pamela Peterson, who, coincidentally, had been an old flame of Kenny's back in high school. The day before, he had also snatched a 17-year-old by the name of Gail Peterson. Roxy and I went into the Barker home during the day, hoping to find Wojciech, but ran into Kenny. After some of Roxy's persuasion, Kenny eventually joined us, and we found Pamela and Gail in the home's basement. We had to destroy Pamela, who had become one of Wojciech's minions, but Gail hadn't yet been turned. There was no trace of Wojciech. Although we knew he'd probably come gunning for Kenny, we couldn't persuade Kenny to come with us. He insisted on going back to his apartment for the night. Roxy and I didn't like it, but we figured he would have to fight his own battle, and maybe sooner or later come to his senses. As it turned out, it was sooner. Much sooner. That night, an apparently enraged Wojciech made an appearance at Kenny's fourth-story window. Hovering there, knocking on the window, like the vampire Danny Glick in Stephen King's Salem Lot. Fortunately, we had given Kenny a water pistol with holy water. When Wojciech made the mistake of breaking the window in an attempt to grab Kenny, he got a blast of water right between the eyes. That was enough to have the vampire break off his assault and go scuttling off to lick his wounds. Kenny had seen pure evil firsthand, an encounter that others surely would not have survived intact, not merely physically, but also mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. But Kenny's strength of character saw him through it, and further would not allow him to remain on the sidelines as a passive bystander in the war of good versus evil, of humanity versus the vampire. That night, he made a commitment to become our apprentice, to learn how to be a slayer of the Mortis vampires, and perhaps, someday, to get retribution for the killing of his old girlfriend, Pamela. Kenny left with us the very next morning. He gave up his family, friends, and life back home in rural West Virginia to move to Los Angeles. He knew that his father, who was still working down in the mines, was deteriorating with black lung disease. Roxy and I sat out in the van while Kenny went in his father's home to say goodbye. She was uncharacteristically quiet while we waited. I think she could see some parallels between Kenny and her own life. Roxy had decided to enter the U.S. Army when she was a year younger than Kenny was now. After she left, her career in the military and later as a mercenary and bodyguard kept her constantly on the road. Her father had since passed, and I knew she had regrets. Roxy sensed that once Kenny left home, he'd probably never see his father and other family members again. But Kenny was tough. He was committed. In the coming weeks, Roxy took a real shining to him taking him under her wing. I think she could see in Kenny a lot of herself at that age, young, rudderless, but with a ferocity of determination. As the months went by, I could see in turn how much Kenny looked up to Roxy, as a friend and mentor, and with a ten-year age difference between them, as something of an older sister. Maybe, too, a little of the mother who had abandoned him years before. When we returned to Los Angeles, Kenny was introduced to the other two members of our team, my childhood friend Steve and Tom Schmidt, a rough-around-the-edges former homicide detective. Tom had already prepared a bedroom for Kenny in our Woodland Hills condo, which also served as the team's headquarters. I asked Steve to spend a few days with Kenny, to show him around the San Fernando Valley and L.A. Basin, and get him a California driver's license and a new set of wheels. Kenny was clearly biting at the bit to get started, so we began his apprenticeship by having him read and study everything our team had documented on our past encounters with the Mortis, beginning with our 1981 epic battle with Alexandria, the Queen of the Vampires, and the sacrifice of my then-girlfriend and Magnus vampire, Bethany. I couldn't bring myself to personally discuss the case with Kenny. Eight years later, the loss of Bethany, my first true love and my oldest childhood friend, Mike, his parents, and my other friends, Dale and Kate, still tore at my soul like a rusty blade to the heart. One evening, 
I sat alone in my darkened study as I heard Steve and Tom, muffled by the closed door, recounting to Kenny the day we penetrated Alexandria's lair in the Devil's Maw. An abandoned and largely forgotten railroad tunnel in the hills along Simi Valley's Santa Susana Pass. When Steve describes that Bethany had died by dragging Alexandria along with her down a bottomless chasm, crushed and buried by collapsing rocks, thus saving the two of us, I felt he got that part wrong. No, I thought, she wasn't truly dead, and not in the sense of how we humans know it. Over the years, she had appeared to me in my most dire moments, providing words of encouragement and motivation. I knew she still looked out after me. She was gone, but she was not truly dead, as her essence, her loving spirit, somehow continued to live on. After getting Kenny up to speed on the basics, our next step was to loan him out for six weeks to Simon, our benefactor, and contact within the benevolent Magnus Vampire clan. Simon's plan was to introduce Kenny to several other Magnus vampires, many of them prominent figures in their communities, so that he could see firsthand from them the Magnus' commitments to live amongst humans in peace and harmony with their pledge to protect the human race from the homicidal tendencies of their mortis counterparts. However, prior to his scheduled departure, I noticed a change in Kenny's normal gregarious demeanor. He brooded for days and was uncharacteristically quiet. I finally had to approach him and ask what was wrong. It was about Roxy. Kenny had learned early on what a vampire's familiar was, and that Roxy was one herself. It started back in West Virginia when Kenny had asked Roxy about the large scar on her neck, and she told him about getting jumped in the L.A. storm drain three years previous and getting bit by Tanya Lieberman, a 17-year-old nymphomaniac mortis vampire. When Kenny asked how she could have been bitten but hadn't turned, Rox explained she was a familiar. A familiar to a Magnus vampire named Simon. To consummate that relationship, she had drunk Simon's blood. His blood, coursing through her veins, had acted as anti-venom to Tanya's bite, a fact that had made the petite teenage psychopath furious. But I could see that when Kenny fully realized what that meant, that Roxy had made a promissory agreement in Bloods to become a Magnus vampire herself someday, it bothered him greatly. And now he was about to meet Simon, the very vampire whom Roxy was beholden to. Kenny couldn't get his mind wrapped around the idea, and I couldn't blame him. I had gone through my own rough patch of coming to terms with it. Jay, he told me. I understand that the Magnus had vowed to live in harmony with humans. We all working together to eradicate the mortars. And sure, I even understand they at least familiars to help them in various ways, like performing tasks in the daylight that they can't. But Roxy, she's a vampire slayer. How could she kill them, even if they are the mortars, and yet want to become one? And when I look at the two of you and see how deeply you care for one another... I just don't understand how that would work. If she becomes one, then I really look up to her, you know? I don't want her to become a vampire. I'd be afraid that, well, something would change, you know? And that bothers me. I don't know how you accept that. I smiled as I looked at Kenny and thought carefully about what I needed to say. Look, Kenny, I began. I know the whole thing is, well, unorthodox to say the least. Roxy had made her pact with Simon long before she met me. It had bothered me too, for a time, but I've learned being a familiar doesn't define her. She's her own individual, with her own thoughts and desires. She's the most warm, caring, and wonderful woman you'll ever meet. And the bravest. She saved my life several times over. I owe her too much to judge her. And it's not my place. I figure when the time comes, Rox will make her decision. And whatever she becomes, her heart will never change. Bethany taught me the love, compassion, and caring that can be in the heart of a Magnus vampire. And nothing is set in stone, Kenny. Roxy may change her mind, but if she chooses to become a Magnus, then I'll have to accept it. She deserves my loyalty and my respect, no matter what happens. And Kenny, no matter what, 
Rox will always be with us. And with you. I can see she cares about you. A lot. That will never change. Do you see what I'm saying? The next morning, Kenny was joking with Roxy at the breakfast table. Like old times. Later, while I sat cleaning my cig sour, Rox approached me and asked, You spoke with Kenny, didn't you? I looked at her and replied, Yep. Thanks, she said, sitting down beside me. Then, after a few moments of silence, she said, He's a good kid. He's going to be a good addition to our team. But I know that me being Simon's familiar bothered him. A reply eluded me. He isn't the only one, I thought to myself. The next morning, Kenny left for Las Vegas, where Simon ran a private detective agency, and one of the best in the country, from all accounts. And not surprising, considering how easy it would be for a vampire to travel or materialize about anywhere when asked by a client to do surveillance and take photos of a cheating spouse, or track down an abducted kid in a child custody case. As it turned out, any worries Kenny had about meeting Simon or living amongst real vampires was quickly assuaged. It didn't take long for Simon and his engaging personality to win Kenny over. He had arranged for Kenny's first visit to be with Althea, a Magnus vampire living as a housewife in Chicago. I had first met Althea in Atlanta during what the Magnus vampires call the Initum Novum, or the New Beginning. The night in 1982, when we succeeded in killing over 200 mortis and their self-proclaimed emperor, Kim Song-ho. According to Simon, Kenny was enthralled with Althea's recounting of the hundreds of years she and Bethany had been hot on the heels of Alexandria, tracking her all throughout Europe, narrowly missing her at the German Hinterkaufic farm in 1922, where Alexandria had killed an entire family and their maid simply for the fun of it. But what she had to impart was much more than just adventure stories. Althea used the encounters to coach Kenny on everything she had ever learned on what made the Mortis vampires tick. Not just what made them ruthless killing machines, but also their thought processes, motivations, habits, aspirations, and yes, even their fears. Her insights were invaluable in helping Kenny get into the actual minds of his adversary. After a week with Althea... Simon shuffled Kenny off to the next Magnus mentor. The oral histories he received from all of them were each unique in their own way. Kenny ultimately came back to us with over twenty journals he had handwritten with all the institutional knowledge the Magnus could provide on the Mortis clan. After his return to L.A., we gave Kenny some time off, and Steve took him down to Malibu Beach to unwind a bit. Kenny had expressed an interest in learning how to surf, and Steve was more than happy to oblige. Several days later, Kenny walked back into the office sporting a golden brown California tan. He had a great time, Steve reported. And he's a natural on the board. Rode quite a few point breaks. Shows some real aptitude. And was quite a hit with the beach girls too, I might add. Roxy walked on over and looked at Kenny with a wicked smile. Well, Don Juan, glad you're all relaxed. Pack your bags. Tomorrow, at 0400 hours, we take off for the desert. Enough playing around. Now we get down to the important things. Kenny gave me a quizzical look and a shrugged. Have fun, I said sympathetically. The next morning, Roxy left with Kenny under her tutelage for two weeks of what she referred to as kick-ass training. Using her contacts, she had arranged access to an undisclosed Black Ops training center in the Mojave Desert, complete with firearms ranges, a high-speed crash-and-bang driving course, and an urban mock-up spanning several city blocks. Roxy's ambitious schedule included firearms training in numerous handguns, rifles and tactical shotguns, hand-to-hand -hand fighting techniques including knife fighting, rigging explosives, surveillance and surveillance detection, high-speed and evasive driving, evasion and escape techniques, surreptitious entry into homes, and several other dirty tricks that I didn't want to know about. When they returned, Kenny was sporting an even deeper tan and looked like he had lost several pounds. How'd it go? I asked. I had a blast, Kenny exclaimed, and I learned a lot. Then he gave a sheepish look over Roxy's way and said, but Roxy didn't have to have his bivouac in tents in the middle of the desert. The mock-up village had real buildings we could have slept in. 
Rox waved her hand dismissively. You gotta do the training realistically, to cover all the bases. There may be times you need to pitch a tent under the stars. Next thing, you'll be complaining to Jack about how I made you kill and cook that rattlesnake we had for dinner. Finally, in the last phase of his training, we had Kenny spend a week with Tom going over his research methodologies, databases, and investigative tools that we use to identify and track mortis activity across the country, as well as introducing Kenny to several of his law enforcement contacts so that Kenny could serve as an alternate POC if Tom was not available. At the end of six months, Kenny's training package was complete. In many respects, he had learned more, and was much better prepared physically and psychologically than either Steve, Tom, or I had been when we first got thrust into the vampire hunting gig. I had to give the kid a lot of credit. He kept his promise, committing himself to learning all he could without complaints, and that earned him the respect from all of us. With Kenny certified to begin working the streets, I divided our team's efforts into two but equal priorities during the past year. First, Steve and Kenny were teamed up to track down the vampire Wojciech. Little was known of him, but we suspected him to be centuries old, and having arrived in North America from Eastern Europe just a few years previously. We all knew that Kenny would never rest easy, always looking behind his back as long as his nemesis remained out there. Wojciech was not one to live and forgive. He was also a sexual predator and a sadistic son of a bitch that particularly likes to deflower young girls. By the time Steve and Kenny had got back on his trail after Brewersville, Wojciech had left West Virginia and went underground. No pun intended. Eventually, they picked up on his trail, and he moved through several states, always leaving a trail of young girls behind. Some they rescued alive, but most not. It wasn't until just this week that we were able to pursue Wojciech to the small town of Marshall, Missouri. I had flown in to lend a hand. It had looked like our best chance to get the bastard yet. We know how that turned out. The team's second priority remained where it had been for the past four years. To track down Tanya, the teenaged psychopathic sadomasochist who within one week of becoming a vampire had killed her parents, several former schoolmates, and their families, and two cops. Worse, she had attempted to kill my own mother and younger sister. As I ingloriously had learned firsthand, Tonya's powers of sexual seduction were irresistible, and her outward facade of an innocent teenaged girl completely belied her capacity for sadistic cruelty and savagery. She was well on her way to becoming the new queen of the Mortis Vampires, filling the voids that remained after the death of the equally evil Alexandria. Not wanting Tanya around for centuries to come, Simon had convinced the Magnus elders to officially label her as the new Inimicus Principalis, or main enemy of the Magnus clan, providing us a priority in funding and resources to track her down. Roxy and I had teamed up and had been on Tanya's trail now for the past four years. I had a score to settle with her for the attempted assassination of my family, and Roxy had a chunk of her neck missing that needed to be avenged. One thing I had often pondered was who within the Mortis clan had bitten Tanya in the first place, and turned her into the revenge weapon against me that she had become. I had never seen Tanya face to face again since our second encounter four years ago to allow me to ask her that question. I suppose it was a moot consideration. Whoever had selected Tanya to get back at me had enabled her to become the new face of the Mortis clan, and its de facto leader. After her failed attack on Roxy, Tanya disappeared into the wind for several months. We eventually discovered that she had fled Los Angeles and had set up her killing grounds in nearby Arizona. Tom's research uncovered a large number of unexplained deaths and disappearances in the area around the old desert mining town of Jerome, Arizona. Coupled with the numerous sightings by local residents of a strange, scantily dressed teenaged girl seen around the hills surrounding the town's long-defunct copper mine, Roxy and I made a beeline to Jerome. It took us a few days of careful snooping and poking around the area, since even though Jerome's United Verde mine had ceased its major operations back in 1953, we had to avoid some of these small-scale mining crews that still worked the area. Eventually, we located Tanya's nest in one of the long-forgotten shafts, where we found and dispatched four of her converts as they slept. But disappointingly, Tanya was nowhere to be found. We had narrowly missed her. 
Perhaps she had been made aware of our presence in town, or maybe it was just her lucky day to have decided to hole up elsewhere. At any rate, the element of surprise had been lost, and we were back to the pursuit. Tanya went dormant for several months, until we picked her up again, following her trail through Flagstaff and eastward into New Mexico. Every time we got close, we would miss her. She began taunting us at every possibility, often leaving sick and depraved calling cards for me to find. And by that, I don't mean a fucking Hallmark card. I think the worst was the killing of the young couple in Albuquerque, New Mexico. A man was admitted to the hospital with a wounds to the throat and multiple bite marks all over his body. He was discovered by his roommates upon coming back to their apartment after a weekend away. The injured man, along with his girlfriend, were found naked in the apartment. The girl's injuries were even more severe, and she was pronounced dead at the scene. The police surmised it was some kind of sex play gone bad, since there were copious amounts of both male and female genital fluids all throughout the apartment. And it was undoubtedly a threesome when, in addition to that of the deceased victim, CSI technicians found vaginal fluids from another woman. Mostly on the man, but on the girl as well. What threw the investigators for a loop was that the fluids from the unidentified female contained all dead cells. In the words of one flustered investigator who confided his findings with Tom, it looked like the couple had had sex with a female corpse. Yet such a corpse was not found at the scene. Could the couple have been into some kind of necrophilia, they wondered. Samples were sent to the lab to get more details on the bite marks. It was noted that they were small, but likely that of a female, yet the punctures seemed abnormally deep for human teeth. One thing I had learned over the years was just how successful the Magnus Vampire clan could be in recruiting familiars that worked in key frontline career fields. Individuals who could prove useful if called upon from time to time in the fight against the Mortis. Cops, firemen, politicians, judges, doctors, the military. The list can go on. Some at the working level, but many others in positions within the very highest circles of power and influence. Perhaps years could go by before their services would ever be required, but when it did, their allegiance was absolute. As luck would have it, the lead homicide investigator on the Albuquerque case was one of these Magnus familiars. Simon made the introduction, and we learned that Detective Mark Lansing had been on the force for nearly twenty years, and had been a Magnus familiar for more than half that. He had definitely been groomed early. Lansing got us access to the male victim where he had been hospitalized. The poor kid had so many bite marks on his body that he looked like he had fallen into a river full of piranhas. The direst wound was the deepest bite into his throat. He had not regained consciousness, and I doubted he would. Lansing looked at me, knowingly, and then said, I thought you should see this. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a photo. The wound's are bandaged now, but this is a photo of what we found carved out on the poor bastard's chest. I took the photo and looked at it. There, etched into the skin, was the name Jack. Below that were the words, Miss You. As I stared at the photo, Lansing continued. It looks like your girl Tanya used a knife, or, or one of her fingernails. Or, I guess, more accurately, a talon. I finished for him. Seems she has the hearts for you. Lansing mused, a slight smile on his face. You could say that? I responded. Since she was in the eighth grade, she was my younger sister's childhood friend. Long story. Lansing nodded. Well, first thing you need to do is finish off the girlfriend before she turns. She's in the morgue. I'll get you in tonight. And I have a feeling this poor guy will be joining her soon. And that's the way it went down. Another two unfortunates to be added to Tanya's growing body count. The last time we picked up her trail was when she had reversed her eastward course and had showed up in Las Vegas. Tom had gotten a call from one of his Magnus familiar contacts within the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department about a murder in one of the casinos on the Strip. The victim was a small-time businessman visiting from Alexandria, Virginia. His name was Lyle McKinley. 
He came to Vegas on a once-in-a-lifetime trip to enjoy the card tables, the good food, and a good time with the local hookers. Most people believe that prostitution is legal in the state of Nevada, and particularly in Las Vegas, but that's not quite the truth. Actually, prostitution is not legal in seven of Nevada's 17 counties, and Clark County, which contains Las Vegas, and Washoe County, which contains Reno, are among those that do not permit prostitution. Most of the state's legal brothels are located in the rural areas of the state. You might have heard of the famous Mustang Ranch, a brothel in Story County, about 20 miles outside of Reno. The closest legal brothel to Las Vegas is in Pahrump, Nevada, which is about an hour's drive away. So, the thing is, many naive tourists who stay in the hotels on the Las Vegas Strip looking to get their rocks off are completely unaware that they are about to partake in illegal activity. At best, they could be the victim of a Las Vegas police undercover sting and face solicitation charges. Worse, felony sex trafficking charges if they're rolled up with an underage prostitute, a charge that carries a penalty of life in prison. There's always the risk of robbery, because the hooker knows they can almost always get away with it because the victim can't easily report the crime to the police. And then, there is the periodic murder of the John, or the prostitutes, over a dispute over money or the quality of service. And this looks to be the case when Tom got the call. A normal report at first, which appeared to be a hapless John found murdered in his hotel room, stripped and robbed of his possessions. But what tripped the reporting was that the medical examiner assessed the body to be completely drained of blood. Lyle was naked and had an ugly wound on the side of his neck. He was found on his stomach, with a hotel champagne bottle inserted into his anus. What really unnerved the responding officers was that Lyle lay in death with a smile on his face. How the fuck? One officer was reported as saying. Could he die with a smile on his face? It had to be painful as hell, poor bastard. Even stranger yet was what they saw in the casino's surveillance video. The cameras clearly showed Lyle playing at the blackjack table. For about an hour, it appeared like he was talking and laughing with someone at his side, when no one was seemingly there. After his win, Lyle got up and went towards the elevator. He had his elbow out, like he had a woman's arm in tow, yet no one was there. More bizarrely, in the elevator, Lyle continued to hug and grope this invisible specter. And at one point, he bent down to plant a kiss on something that couldn't be seen. When he stepped off the elevator, that was the last Lyle McKinley was seen alive, since the hallways had not yet had cameras installed. His bizarre behavior was chalked up to drugs, yet none was found in his system. However, the most telling piece of evidence was found on the writing desk not far from the cooling remains of Lyle McKinley. On the desk was a note, scrawled on the hotel stationery. It had the message, This schmuck couldn't get it up. Not like you, Jack. You were hard as a rock. Someday I feel you thrusting inside me, throbbing and kneading. And when you come, I'll be as one with you. Forever. Love, Tanya. Thank God the Magnus Familiar Mole in the Las Vegas PD took the notes before it became a piece of official evidence. I had hopes to spare Roxy, but of course she saw it eventually. Roxy had long ago forgiven me for what happened with Tanya, but the note was like tearing a scab off of a festering wound. I'll just say she wasn't the most pleasant to be around for several days afterwards. It seems Tanya would taunt me at Roxy's expense forever, and there was nothing I could do about it. Not until I cut off the bitch's head and put an end to it. After the Las Vegas incidents, Tanya again disappeared into the wind. For the past year, we had no indication where she may have gone. It didn't make sense that someone of her psychopathic egomania would lay dormant, with no signs of her violence or cruelty. Even the Magnus had no leads where she may have gone to ground. But Simon surmised that she was laying low, trying to build up more followers. That possibility was truly frightening. I pushed away all these memories as my flight from Kansas City finally touched down in Los Angeles, arriving just before 6 p.m. I still had a slight buzz as I got off the plane. Worse, a headache. I cursed myself for feeling sorry for myself. I had to get my head back into the game, 
As I exited the terminal at LAX, it was great to smell the ocean breeze once again. It helped clear my head. I picked up my father's 1969 Ford Mustang from the short-term lot and jumped onto the 405 North, heading to San Fernando Valley. In another hour, I arrived back to the Woodland Hills condo. As soon as I walked in, I was literally picked up in a tight hug and thrown to the floor. I found myself lying on the living room carpet, looking up into the bright blue eyes of a strikingly beautiful woman. She smiled mischievously as she lay atop me, her ample breasts hard to ignore as they crushed into my chest. Her long blonde hair fell into my face and smelled of jasmine. Well, I managed to croak out. That's one hell of a welcome for only being gone three days. Maybe I should stay away more often. Roxy's face lowered down to mine. She whispered seductively into my ear. I hope you're not too worn out from your trip. I have an itch that desperately needs to be scratched. I smiled and was about to come up with a witty answer when there was a cough from across the room. I looked over and Tom was sitting at the conference table in front of his multiple police scanners and radios. Well, if you two lovebirds would like to go to the bedroom for a while, that's fine, Tom said in his usual gruff voice. But when you're done, I have some news about Tanya. The mention of Tanya's name was tantamount to being doused with a bucket of ice water, completely spoiling the amorous mood. As she rolled off me, Roxy growled. Tom, you old fart. I've been sitting here for an hour waiting for Jack, and you didn't mention anything about any update on Tanya. Tom feigned an innocent look, and shrugging, replied, I knew he'd be back soon, and I didn't see the need to go through all the details twice. I figured it could wait. As Roxy stared daggers at Tom, I knew the real reason Tom had waited. It was because he couldn't trust Roxy to not go off half-cocked, and he needed me to be there to keep her under control. We both knew that, above all else, Roxy's number one emotional hot button was Tanya. And that, even more than Tanya's personal attack on her, first and foremost, Rox wanted revenge for my near seduction at the hands of the teenaged vampire. I figure whatever Tom had to say, it was probably a good solid lead on Tanya's whereabouts. All right, Tom, I said as I pulled up a chair. Let's hear it. Rox sat down next to me, continuing to glower at Tom. Okay. About a week ago, I noticed a police report about an incident down in L.A.'s industrial district. A shift worker in a warehouse located on Glady's Avenue went out for a smoke just before midnight and never returned. The boss thought the guy just walked off the job, but then they found his cap and a small amount of blood in the back alley. LAPD investigated, but my contacts tell me there wasn't much to go on, except to confirm the blood was that of the missing worker. I filed the report away for future reference. Then, two days ago, there was another police report about an assault in the same area, but on Crocker Street. Not far from Skid Row, actually. In this case, a warehouse worker suffered several contusions to his face and body, and his right wrist was broken. He told the cops he was approached by a teenaged girl when he was outside on break, having a cup of coffee. It was around one in the morning. I'm going to read you the statement he gave the LAPD. I was standing near the rear loading dock, having a cup of coffee. My shift wasn't quite over, but since I clocked in early, I had called it quits. I saw this girl come into the alley off a of crocker. She looked young, in her mid to late teens, long brown hair. Petite, very slim. She was a real looker. Dressed in jean cutoffs and a skimpy halter top, showing off her belly. Little more than a bra, really. I figured her for a hooker. We got a lot of them around the area. I was about to tell her to get lost, but I suddenly couldn't speak. Couldn't even move or look away. Her eyes seemed to sparkle red, and for some reason, I was just fixated on them. As she got closer, I just kept staring into her eyes. I could tell she was smiling. Then, without warning, she grabbed my neck and picked me off my feet. I couldn't breathe, and I felt my feet dangling in the air. She suddenly threw me against the trash dumpster, and I hit my face hard. I rolled over and looked up, and she bent down to my face. She sniffed my hair like a dog. I heard her say something like, 
So nice. She opened her mouth, and her teeth were not normal. She had fangs, just like a snake, or a fucking movie vampire. Her breath stank to high heaven, the smell of death. I knew I was going to die. Just then, the rear doors flew open, and the guys started pouring out. It was the end of the shift. Everyone heading out to their cars. The girl's head whipped around, and I heard her snarl, her hiss. It sounded like she was pissed off. Then she left. She was there one second, and gone the next. I think I passed out for a second. When I came to, the guys were carrying me back inside. This statement is true to the best of my knowledge. I spoke with the LAPD officer who took the statement, Tom said. And as you can imagine, they took it with a grain of salt. The worker weighed about 210, and it was hard to picture a petite, teenaged girl picking him up and throwing him around. And the claim she was some kind of vampire, well, that, of course, had its usual results. The cops thought for sure he had been drinking more than just coffee. But once he was at the hospital, he was checked for any substances. There were none. Not even alcohol. Tom pulled out another document. Then there's this, he went on. Based on those two reports, I went back over two months' worth of recorded calls to the police. From businesses as well as residents around the industrial area. I found this, a call from two weeks ago. From the manager of a small Hispanic food warehouse on Kohler Street. He called because he was concerned the empty building across the street was becoming some kind of crackdown. Or house of prostitution. For several days, he had spotted a girl go in and out. No activity at all in the daytime, he noted, but most evenings, he would see her. Once or twice, she took a man inside with her. He said the girl was very young, probably a teenager, and was always wearing low-rider jean shorts and a pink altered top. I checked the LAPD records and it looked like they ignored the man's concerns. No patrol was ever dispatched to investigate the vacant warehouse. So, of course... The next step was to check out the ownership of that building. Once I had the address, I did some digging. And guess what? The property had indeed been empty since the last company to own it went out of business some 18 months ago. Then, 45 days ago, it was bought by some commercial entity calling itself Maximus Enterprises. I checked the LA property records and all the paperwork is legal and correct, Someone by the name of Theodore Falco signs the documents, and I checked. His closing appointment at the L.A. land office was at 10 a.m. on a bright and sunny day. Roxy stated the obvious. He's a familiar, she stated. That little bitch got herself a familiar. He's helping her get set up in a safe and secure place, and who knows, it may even become a legitimate business. The perfect front for a hideout. But that's definitely her. Rather sloppy feeding in her own neighborhood, though. She should have known we look for those kinds of reports. I nodded and said, Well, she messed up and that's good for us. Roxy stood up. Good work, Tom. She complimented, clearly forgiving him for holding out on her earlier. We'll all go over first thing tomorrow morning. I have a good feeling about this. We're finally going to get the bitch. Tom gave me a wink. Translation. Good luck, kid. You have your hands full. The next morning, we woke up at dawn and had breakfast in the condo. We inventoried and checked our go bags to make sure we had everything we needed. My bag contains two high pressure water pistols filled with holy water recently delivered to us by my friend and barber, John Guzman. The water had been blessed and sanctified by his brother, Diego Fernando. A padre who ran the local Catholic parish, consisting of many of their fellow Colombian emigres. I made sure to pack extra vials of the water, two blessed crucifixes, and the Thompson family Bible. I never went out without it. It belongs to Ida, the mother of my closest friend, Mike, who had been killed by the mortis. It had saved my life, and Tom's, in our encounter with Alexandria, the Vampire Queen. Lastly, I put on the shoulder holster that carried my 45 caliber 6 Sauer P220. One couldn't be too careful. I watched as Roxy did the same. Ever the gun enthusiast, she had recently swapped out her old Bren 10 for the newer Smith & Wesson model 645. 
Truth be told, I wasn't sure it was just a coincidence that Detective Sonny Crockett had also swapped out his Bren 10 for the Model 645, beginning with the third season of the hit TV show Miami Vice, which, as I well knew, was Roxy's favorite show. At least now it was a whole lot easier buying ammunition with most of the team using the same caliber. Tom's Colt 1911 also fed on 45 ACP. The odd men out were Steve and Kenny. Steve favored the lighter 9mm rounds because it gave him a larger magazine capacity, and Kenny didn't even carry a handgun. He preferred a Remington 12-gauge pump shotgun, carrying double lot shells. How does the saying go? You can take a boy out of the country, but not the country out of the boy. As we got ready to leave, I suddenly turned to Roxy. Hey, uh, let's take your car. That industrial area is pretty seedy, and I don't want to take the Mustang down there. It was true. That part of L.A. encompassed a 36-block area, most of it between 3rd Street on the north, Olympic Boulevard on the south, Alameda on the east, and San Pedro on the west. There were over 140 properties in that area, mostly dilapidated warehouses and buildings, with a fair share of growing homeless camping along the streets. Roxy gave me one of her looks. But it's okay for me to take my Trans Am? She asked with a smirk. The truth was, I was the one who had bought her the 1985 Pontiac Firebird after she had recovered from her attack by Tanya. It was a beautiful candy apple red and was powered by a 5.0 liter 305 engine. Rox knew that, but she played it up to the hilt. Well, what happens if it gets vandalized or stolen? Will you buy me another one? I laughed and said, Rox, one look at you and I doubt anyone's gonna fuck with your car. Okay, she said, acquiescing but only because I love you so much. I smiled to myself. Roxy knew my sentimentality surrounding my Mustang. As my father's pet ride, it was one of the last things I had to remind me of him. Even if I had not suggested taking her car, she would have volunteered to do so. Tommy walked out to his car, a 1985 Plymouth Grand Fury. Once a cop, always a cop. He threw his go bag inside as well as his usual high-capacity water cannon, and then turns to Roxy and I. Okay, kids, I'm ready to go. I'll follow. Remember, Channel 5 on our radio. A year previously, Tom had wired all our cars for VHF radio. No matter where we traveled, we were now able to have vehicular communication, especially critical when conducting surveillance operations or during stakeouts. The ability to communicate to the team had been a lifesaver more than once. The entrance to the Ventura Freeway was right around the corner, just down Topanga Canyon Boulevard. Before we knew it, we had jumped on the 101 heading east. Traffic was light, and I figured we'd make good time getting downtown. As I picked up the handset to the VHF radio, I heard Roxy groan. Shit, Jack, don't do it. She pleaded, although her smile betrayed her. I smiled back, then keyed the mic. One Adam 12, one Adam 12, come in. Within moments, Tom's cantankerous voice came across the airwaves. God damn it, Jack. I said a hundred times to stop that shit. This radio is for real world comms. And do I look like either Malloy or Reed? Christ. I laughed. Officers Pete Malloy and Jim Reed were played by actors Martin Milner and Kent McCord on Jack Webb's Adam 12, the hit TV show that ran from 1968 to 1975, about an LAPD patrol unit and their adventures. Ever since I'd learned Tom had met both actors on filming location back when he was with the LAPD, I couldn't resist having a little mischievous fun. One out of twelve, just thought you'd like some flashbacks to your good times on the beat. All good on this end. No wants, no warrants. Over. There was only radio silence. He's going to ignore you now, Roxy said, laughing. Well, he's right about Officer Malloy and Reed, I chuckled. Tom's probably now about 50 pounds over the LAPD weight standards. Not long after merging from the 101 onto 405 South, we left the San Fernando Valley and drove along the Sopalvada Pass to the Santa Monica Mountains. Soon after cresting the rise into the L.A. Basin, we passed the exit for Sunset Boulevard, the route I used to take when I was attending UCLA Film School. Seemed like light years ago, I thought. After our next exit into the Santa Monica Freeway, we were heading towards downtown L.A. We could see the city center in the distance. There was the Crocker Tower with 54 floors, 
the Security Pacific Plaza with 55 floors, and the first interstate tower with 67 floors, the latter which, unfortunately, had suffered a terrible fire just the year before that killed one person and injured 40. But new on the horizon was the City of Angels' tallest building, with 73 floors known locally as the Library Tower. It had opened just this month, October of 1989. With the San Gabriel Mountains as a backdrop, the city's skyscrapers were indeed an impressive sight. We got off the 10 and made our way towards Kohler Street. The industrial area of LA was a mishmash of small warehouses, many of them shuttered, but just as many bustling with activity. There was warehouses and distribution points for Hispanic and Asian foods, auto parts, restaurant supplies, electronics, you name it. Everything that kept Los Angeles running. Once we turned on Kohler, we decided to park about a block from Tanya's suspected lair, so Roxy pulled over to park alongside the street. Tom pulled in right behind us. We all got out, grabbed our gear, and moved on down the street towards the warehouse. The street was pretty quiet, since several of the buildings appeared closed or shuttered. Even the industrial district had its share of urban blight. Those warehouses that were open along the road were also fairly quiet, Fortunately, most of the activity would be at the loading docks, located around to the rear of each building. As we got to our destination, I could see it was a two-story red brick building. Tom's search of property records indicated it was originally built in the 1930s. Back then, it was a garment factory, and was home to a company that produced a large share of uniforms for the U.S. Army during the Second World War. In the 1960s, it had been bought out by a small electronics company that specialized in producing ventilation fans for homes and autos. In recent years, it changed owners many times, mostly being used as a warehouse for wholesale goods, making their way to various consumer outlets in greater Los Angeles. I looked across the streets and spotted the Hispanic food warehouse, whose owner had reported the odd comings and goings at the door where we were now standing. I didn't see anyone but we didn't need any prying eyes on us more than necessary. We needed to get into the building as quick as possible. Okay, Rox, do your thing, I told her. But as I turned back around, I could see she was already picking the lock on the door. Tom and I stood together, doing our best to block her from street view until we heard her say, Okay, let's go. Within a few seconds, we slipped inside and Roxy shut the door behind us. We were thrust into almost pitch darkness. We simultaneously reached for our flashlights and switched them on. As we swept the room with beams of light, it became obvious why it was so dark. All the windows had been covered over with what looked like thick brown wrapping paper. Clearly, the new owners took precautions to make sure the daylight couldn't enter the building. We gave each other a nod of understanding. Vampires must have seclusions during the day. The main reason is to seek respite from the rays of the sun. Contrary to modern literature and film, it is not the physical nature of the sun that is harmful to the vampire. It is not the heat, or the ultraviolet light, or the radiation. Rather, it is the very essence of the sun itself. Just turn to the Bible to learn of the sun's incredible symbolism and meaning. It's seen as the start of creation as the greater light, a great luminary of heaven. God made the greater light to rule the day to rise upon evil and serve man. The Book of Psalms has many passages alluding to the power of God within the sun, one of which is, from the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Book of John elucidates. The light is hated by everyone whose acts are evil, and he does not come to the light for fear that his acts will be seen. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The shining and brilliant depiction of the sun symbolizes Christ and Christ-like virtues. Indeed, in scripture, the sun is the house in which the greatest enemy of Satan, Archangel Michael, lives. Thus, it is the spiritual essence of the sun, its representation of God and all that is pure and good, that the vampire cannot be exposed to, lest face physical decay and destruction. The ancient vampire slayers within the Catholic Church had discovered this centuries ago. And in the Liber Demonium et Immortorium, 
their secret book mortorium on demonology and the history of Homo Nosferatu Vampiris, commissioned by the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire in the 16th century, they had written. And when the rays of God's sun had touched upon the unholy skin of the vampire, the corrupt flesh of the undead had burst into flame, becoming a mighty fire that consumes both the physical body and the vampire's evil essence, leaving just dust that would then return to the earth. We stood in a vast open room which, judging from the large sliding doors on the back side of the building, served as the main loading or receiving bay within the warehouse. The bay was nearly empty, except for a stack of crates in the corner that were stenciled Maximus Enterprises. Bingo, I thought. There were large hallways leading off to the right and left. I pointed a finger, suggesting we start the search by heading to our left. During our strategy planning session, we had already agreed to keep speech to a minimum, staying as quiet as possible. The Nosferatu vampires do not truly sleep during the day, or at least not what we think of as sleep. They are the undead, after all, and the dead need no sleep. I would liken it more to a state of resting, or reconstitution. The Mortis vampires are killing machines, natural predators, and like any predator, after the thrill of the hunt and the effort of the actual kill, they are physically satiated, gorged with blood, and need time to digest and recover. Just as a sated lion will sleep up to twenty hours a day, the vampire, too, feels compelled to rest in the day. They do this away from the sun's rays, but unlike the stereotype, they don't lie in coffins, and they don't need their native earth or the dirt from their grave to rest in. Over the years, I've found sleeping vampires in everything from the grandest bedrooms tucked between the finest silk sheets to rat-infested tunnels of a sewer system. In their resting status, they are in a dissociated state. I suppose one could liken it to the stage one of our own sleep cycle, also called light sleep. The transition between wakefulness and full sleep. The body is relaxed, but the mind is not truly unconscious. While this is an advantage to the vampire hunter, the target can be easily awakened. And once that happens, the fully cognizant vampire can quickly become as deadly and dangerous as if it were nighttime. We turned and started walking towards two large double doors that led to the next room. The beams of our flashlights danced around the wall. Suddenly, Roxy reached out and grabbed Tom, who was about to step through the doorway. Tom turned and Roxy shook her head. She then pointed down to the floor. There, now fully illuminated in the light, we could see that fishing line had been placed across the doorway, about an inch up off the floor. Roxy stuck her head through the entrance and traced the line. It was tied to a bundled group of bottles that sat on a shelf. If the line had been pulled, the bottles would have gone crashing to the floor. It had been a tripwire, designed to provide early warning to the resting vampire. In the dim light, it would have been impossible to see. Roxy, as usual, had her head in the game. Tom nodded and mouthed a thank you. We all stepped over the wire and entered the next room. It too was nearly empty, but over in the far corner there looked to be a pile of blankets or clothing. We cautiously approached, and in short order could see two feet and a hand protruding out from underneath a filthy, dark green blanket. Was it a vagrant or a squatter? I wondered. I wouldn't want to cut off the head of some hapless, homeless person. I silently removed my pocket mirror, knelt down, and looked for the reflection of one of the feet. There was nothing. I gave Roxy and Tom a nod of affirmation, and then we circled around the body. Roxy took the head, Tom took one side, and me on the other. She took out a set of special gloves she had fabricated for just this type of maneuver, and put them on. I reached in my bag and took out Bethany's silver knife. I gave Rox and Tom one final nod, and in an instant, we yanked off the blanket. Almost instantaneously, even as my mind registered that the individual underneath was a young Asian man wearing a UCLA Bruins t-shirt, Roxy slammed her gloved hand over his mouth. His eyes suddenly flew open, in both surprise and anger, and I could see the yellow irises, ringed with red veins, surrounding elongated, serpent-like black pupils. 
Tom immediately pinned the vampire's arms down as best as he could, leveraging his large size and weight. For my part, without any further hesitation, I plunged the dagger right into the creature's heart. Black, noxious ichor erupted out the wound and quickly covered my hand. Roxy's glove, made of more metal than cloth, muffled the vampire's scream, while at the same time preventing his fangs from biting into her hand. I kept twisting the dagger into the monster's heart until his struggles became less and less, and eventually ceased altogether. A final eruption of ichor poured out of his eyes, nose, and ears, quickly soaking into the knees of Roxy's jeans where she knelt at the head. Not long later, I was placing the vampire's decapitated head upon his chest. The body did not deteriorate too badly, indicating he hadn't been a vampire for very long. Pretty good, I thought. We had dispatched him quietly and efficiently in under three minutes. Hopefully we could maintain the same level of stealth as we moved through the building, because now there was no longer any doubt. Tanya's here, I whispered to Roxy and Tom. They nodded, and I could detect their heightened excitement. We were now in hot pursuit of the number one Mortis target. We were close. Very close. We continued our sweep through the ground floor of the warehouse, always wary of any tripwires or other early warning traps. It was very quick going, since the warehouse was devoid of any equipment, boxes, or furniture. We found two more vampires, a male and female, also young in their twenties, sleeping side by side, arms around each other, in a parody of a loving, romantic couple. I had a feeling that, just like the Asian man, they were local college students. Tanya liked them young, like her, I thought. You probably are thinking to yourself, do we ever try to find out who these missing people are, the vampires that we encounter and then destroy, so we can in some way notify their families to bring some closure, especially the poor victims that have been newly turned? The honest answer is, well, sort of. We note their physical description, their clothing, and if they have any still in their possession, their ID. Tom then runs the info through the missing persons databases and local police reporting to see if we can make a positive identification. Sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't. You'd be surprised the number of people that go missing all the time, and their disappearance is never reported. The dregs of society, the lost, the homeless, and forgotten, they are never missed. Whatever we can discover, the results go into our own database. Using that data, we can then do a linkage analysis that can help to ascertain the primary vampire's physical hunting ground, its victim preferences, and anything else that could make it possible to narrow down the location of its lair. But no, we don't try to notify the families. We don't send some anonymous letter to let them know how their loved one died. What could possibly be gained by that? We don't tell them or the cops where the body is. Often they're found soon enough. It's horrific that some families will soon learn their missing son or daughter was found decapitated in some shithole warehouse in downtown Los Angeles. But that's the way it has to be. We don't have time to dispose of the bodies just to protect the sensitivities of the families. It may sound cold, but that's the reality. We are at war with the Mortis vampires, and in war things are not pleasant. Things turn ugly. Ugly on both sides. War is not for the faint of heart. That's for damn sure. It was a little more challenging dispatching the vampire couple without making much noise, but we succeeded. Roxy had to use both gloved hands to keep their mouths shut as Tom pinned them down with his weight, and I made quick, successive stabs to their hearts. I had to make multiple stabs until their strength began to dwindle. Eventually, all the fights had left them, and I was able to thoroughly destroy each of their hearts with twists from my knife. Several minutes later, we left their decapitated bodies behind as we headed up the stairs to the next floor. After passing another tripwire at the top of the stairs, we could see the floor plan was similar to the ground floor. We went to the left as before, almost immediately we stumbled upon another vampire, lying atop a flattened out cardboard box. This one was a woman, slightly older than the others, maybe in her late twenties. It looked like she was wearing a waitress's uniform. A nameplate on her breast told me her name was Eileen. Well, Eileen, I thought sadly as I got my knife ready. 
I hope you'll finally get to have some peace now. After her, in a nearby restroom, we found a guy in his thirties curled up on the tile floor. Hispanic, dressed in shabby work clothes. Maybe the missing warehouse worker from Tom's report. Or maybe one of the derelicts from nearby Skid Row. Either way, another hapless victim of Tanya's bloodlust. Five vampires down, and all without putting up much of a struggle. The highest body count we had accumulated for some time. We were on a roll. Tom must have been reading my mind. Piece of cake, kid, he whispered cockily as we entered the next room. We all came to an abrupt halt as our flashlight beams cut through the existing dim light of the room. I could feel my mouth hang open as I was temporarily at a loss of words. Finally, I turned to Tom and managed to whisper, And you were saying? For only the second time since I've known him, the old cop looked truly scared. The first was when he met Alexandria, the Queen of the Vampires, face to face seven years previous. Fuck me, was all he could muster in reply. There, lying across nearly the entire length of the floor, almost head to toe, many lying atop each other, crisscrossing every which way, was a literal army of mortis vampires. Well, more like a platoon, at least forty of them, maybe more. I was wrong about Tanya. She hadn't been just busy. She had been absolutely industrious, building up her own army of vampires. If all these vampires succeeded in replicating the same numbers, well, it was a truly horrific thought. I was literally looking at the biggest threats to humankind since the death of the self-proclaimed Mortis Emperor Kim Song Ho. During the Initum Novum, or the New Beginning, in Atlanta four years previously. We're in deep shit, I urgently whispered. If we don't get out of here now, our neck crucifixes won't protect us from so many. We need a hell of a lot more manpower and firepower. I think it's too late, Jack. I heard Roxy reply, much too loudly. Why is she not whispering? I thought, insanely. She's breaking protocol. She's going to wake the fuckers up was all I could think. Then, what I saw chilled my blood. One of the vampires, a young man with long, dirty, blonde hair, was looking right at me. His eyes were glowing a predatory red, and I could already sense the malevolence, the hunger, in them. But what scared me to the core was what was below them. His mouth was open in a hideous grim stretching unnaturally wide from ear to ear. A truly happy smile, like that of a meat lover just being served a juicy, medium-rare, ten-ounce filet mignon wrapped in succulent bacon. As I watched, two large viper-like fangs slid downwards from fleshy hinges in the vampire's mouth. They were curved with wickedly sharp points, and were already glistening with dripping saliva in anticipation of piercing human flesh. Our flesh. As we started to get up, Roxy screamed. Water guns, now! We immediately dropped our bags, taking out our water guns in the process. Tom had already unslung the water cannon that he had been carrying over his shoulder. By that point, more and more vampires had awakened, their eyes wide open and locking onto our own. The room was beginning to fill with snake-like hisses and low, inhuman growls. Tom, go to the left, Roxy commanded. Jack, take the middle. I'll take the right. Let him have it, and let's corral them into the corner. I could see her plan. Our only option, our only way to escape alive, was to inundate them with holy water, head off their attack, and push them back into the far corner of the room. We couldn't kill them with just holy water. They would eventually regenerate but it would buy us some time to get out. I opened up immediately, just as one of the vampires started to lunge towards me. I sprayed the first wave, rotating the water gun from left to right, then right to left. As the blessed and sanctified water hit their bodies, the vampires reeled back in agony, their skin blackening and blistering as it sizzled. They were immediately replaced by several more who leapt towards me, their jaws snapping like rabid dogs. One woman, who if I wasn't mistaken was wearing an airline stewardess uniform, climbed over the top of a few of the fallen and succeeded in grasping onto me with one of her claw-like hands. 
She spat at me, her spittle flying, and hissed out the words, Jack Walker. She knew who I was. Not surprising, since I had been killing her kind for years. But as I raised up the water gun, she did something unexpected. She smiled. The kind of smile that chills you to the bone. Like the smile of a Jim Jones acolyte happily embracing the cup of a cyanide-laced cherry Kool-Aid. At peace with themselves, and ready to show their readiness to sacrifice themselves for their master's warped vision. I heard her snarl. You will die, Jack Walker, and your blonde bitch. Tanya will avenge us. Long live our glorious queen. I cut her off with a shot of water right into her offending mouth. The high-velocity stream blew an exit hole right through the back of her head. I could see portions of her occipital periental bone fly to the rear, followed by liquefied brain matter. The woman toppled over like dead weight. Take that to your fucking queen. I spat. Within seconds, another wave of the vampires began scrambling over her body, their mouths clicking and clacking like crazed nutcrackers, their elongated fingers stretching forward in a frenzied attempt to grab onto me. I aimed again and squeezed the trigger. The stream started to wane, becoming weaker until it was a mere trickle. I threw the gun away and brought up my second, just in time, as the vampires now were so close I could smell their fetid breaths. The smell of death and decay. My next burst cut through their ranks like they were butter. I was able to take a few steps forward now. I looked over at Tom and Roxy and saw that they were making some progress too. We had them contained and were backing them into the corner. I continued to shoot, now more selectively. A burst into the chest of one, a burst into the face of another, trying to conserve the water. Eventually, the three of us controlled more than half the room with most of the vampires penned in. The candle is almost dry, I heard Tom warn. We need an exit plan. Keep pushing them back, Roxy shouted. All the way. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I could see several of the damaged vampires from the initial waves were getting back up. They were slowly rejuvenating. They're going to come up behind us, I yelled. We need to leave. No, Jack, Roxy shouted back. Just a little bit more. I knew what we were doing was probably suicidal. We needed to leave before we completely ran out of water. We needed a way to protect our rear as we tried to get out of the building. But I trusted Rox. She had a plan. I didn't know what the fuck it was, but I had to believe she knew what she was doing. Seconds later, I heard Tom yell out. I'm out, he announced simply, a tone of resignation in his voice. Good enough, Roxy exclaimed. And then she reached into her bag. I watched as she pulled out her Heckler and Coke MP5. A submachine gun capable of firing 800 9mm rounds a minute. I've witnessed Rox use it with deadly accuracy on several occasions. Damn, I thought. The girl sure comes prepared. But it couldn't help us now. The rounds would just end up tickling the vampires who were already starting to regroup. We were in some serious shit. But at the blink of an eye, Rox slammed a magazine into the gun and racked the bolt, loading the weapon. Hope you brought your sunscreen, you bastards! She shouted. She immediately tilted the barrel upwards and began firing. The sound of shattering glass suddenly filled the room. The windows. I realized she was going for the windows. I had forgotten about them since they had been covered up. Within seconds, the room was awash in sunlight. Beautiful, beautiful sunlight. Damn, that Roxy. She was as smart as a fox. She had known what she was doing all along. We succeeded in concentrating all the vampires into the corner of the room, surrounded by long rows of windows. The perfect death trap. Suddenly, the room was filled with deafening shrieks, the unholy screams of forty dying vampires. Their wails were worse than any banshee ever imagined out of old Irish folklore. I felt my eardrums were going to burst. I stumbled back a few steps, and it's a good thing I did. The next thing I heard was a whoosh. The sound of sudden ignition. A second later, my body was knocked violently backwards from some kind of air blast. I was suddenly engulfed in an overpressure of tremendous heat, and I could feel the skin on my face blister and scorch, and my hair singe and curl. 
I shielded my eyes with my hands, but through my fingers I could see the vampires were now awash in flames. The heat was super intense. The room had become one huge crematorium. I was witnessing an unprecedented event of forty-some bodies erupting into spontaneous combustion. The clothes of the vampires had already incinerated, and now their flesh was blackening. The smell of burning flesh was sickening, and smoke was filling the room. I could see some of the vampires doing a death dance as their insides began to boil and liquefy. A couple of them tried to stagger towards the doorway, but it was already too late. Their charred legs quickly gave out, and they collapsed to the floor, the flames continuing to consume their bodies. One vampire, still with hate in his eyes, made a final lunge towards me. Before he could reach me, his exposed skin peeled off and flew away behind him like ribbons in a strong wind, leaving a flaming trail in their wake. I felt Tom's hand on my shoulder. Let's get out of here, kid, he said. This heat's gonna set the whole damn place on fire. He was right. The old warehouse, even empty, was a tinderbox. Rox was already slinging the MP5 over her shoulder and was heading our way. The smoke was so thick it was hard to find our way to the doorway. Once back in the hallway, I took a look back. The room had turned into a charnel house. Blackened and charred skeletons littered the floor. The smoke was starting to billow out the broken out windows. It won't take long until someone calls the fire department, I announced to Tom and Roxy. We need to leave. No, yelled Roxy. We have to look for Tanya. We haven't searched the rest of the floor. She's here. I know it. We have to finish her. Roxy started to stomp off down the smoke-filled hall. Flames were already starting to lap around the ceiling. I ran over to her and twirled her around. Her face was a mask of rage, frustration, and desperation. Her obsession with killing Tanya had overtaken all reason. Damn it, Roxy. Use your head. I yelled above the sound of the inferno. If Tanya's here, she'll have nowhere to go. The fire will burn her into the daylight. She'll be finished. And so will we if we don't get the hell out of here, like right now. I could see indecision cross Roxy's face. The thought of Tanya getting away was anathema to her. She would be willing to remain in the burning building to find the teenaged vampire. As she still hesitated, I played my last card. If you stay, I stay, I said, looking into her eyes. We always have each other's back, remember? She blinked, and I could tell that got through to her. I knew that her love for me far out-trumped her hatred for Tanya. Rox would never do anything purposeful to put me into jeopardy. You're right, she said, conceding. Let's get out of here. The top floor of the building was already a raging inferno as we made our way back down the stairs. When we got back to the main loading dock area, Roxy grabbed my shoulder. Let's go out these back loading doors, she yelled. The front's probably full of onlookers by now. Tom and I nodded, and we found the sliding rear door. It was chained and padlocked. Smoke was already filling the bay, and we didn't have much time. My nose burnt with the sickly sweet smell of burning flesh, barely undercut by the noxious stench of melting insulation, electric wiring, ceiling tiles, and the building's old, peeling paint. Stand back, Roxy commanded, and she pulled out her pistol. After a few well-aimed shots, the lock fell off. Tom and I put all our weight into it and got the door to start sliding down its rail. We finally got it open a few feet, wide enough for us to slip out. One by one, we stumbled out onto the back parking lot, hacking and coughing. It was wonderful to breathe clean, fresh air. And we were in luck. There was no one at the rear of the building. All the gawkers were probably on the street. But it wouldn't be long until the place would be swarming with firemen. I could hear the approaching wail of sirens. We made our way around the side of the building. The growing crowd of onlookers didn't give us any attention. Their eyes were riveted on the flames that had engulfed the building. We easily emerged into the crowd in the ensuing chaos, and soon we made our way back to our cars. After we told Tom we'd meet him back at the condo, Roxy and I got into her Firebird and shut the doors. We sat in silence as we watched a line of fire vehicles drive past. Judging from the number of engines, it was probably a four or five alarm fire. The city wouldn't take many chances considering one fire could lead to the entire warehouse district going up in flames. Roxy sat silent for the longest time, staring out the windshield towards the melee down the road. I knew she was disappointed, 
So was I. It was the closest we had gotten to Tanya in years. Look, Rox, I started. We hurt Tanya bad today. Real bad. Close to 50 of her minions wiped out. Maybe even more that we haven't found. We just destroyed years of her work. We haven't taken out that many mortars since that night in Atlanta with Kim Song Ho. A lot of vampires will be off the streets tonight. We did good. You did good, Roxy. You probably saved all our lives. You, me, and Tom. It, you knew, didn't you? Getting all them corralled into the corner and then shooting out the windows. It was brilliant. Roxy didn't say anything. Just gave me a nod. More silence. So much for my motivational speaking ability, I thought. I saw it. You want to know why I love you so much? I asked. I reached down and took her hands in mine. Because you're smart, intuitive, and courageous. All your decisions, all your actions, you put others above self. Every day, I thank God that you're by my side, protecting humanity from the evil of the mortis. I could never do it without you. You have an inner strength that I could only hope to have. It's your energy, your passion, that sustains me. So come on, let me see the old Roxy. Can I at least get a smile? Roxy finally turns towards me, and, to my relief, her face broke into a small smile. So, she chuckled, was that one of the famous Jack Walker pep talks? I leaned over and gave her a kiss on her forehead. The best I could come up with on the fly, I said. When we got back to the Woodland Hills condo, we could see Tom's Grand Fury parked outside. He had beat us back. When Roxy and I opened the door and stepped inside, we were suddenly inundated in a virtual tsunami of welcomes and accolades. Steve and Kenny had arrived back from Kansas, and it soon became obvious Tom had filled the both of them in. Before I knew what was happening, Steve had grabbed me into a big bear hug. My god, bro, thank god you're safe. He blurted out, and he gave me a tremendous squeeze. And, uh, congrats. Holy shit. I can't believe it. Almost 50 of those bloodsuckers taken out in one shot? Awesome, dude. And with the sunlight. Fucking radical, man. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Kenny was giving Roxy a big hug. Damn, Roxy. I heard him exclaim. Why couldn't I have been there with you? It's just my luck. I'm always missing out on the action. And man, what a fucking badass. Shooting out the windows with your MP5. Taking on a whole room of mortars. This one for the history books. And I missed the whole damn thing. He continued to lament. Inwardly, I had a chuckle. Kenny had already been completely enamored with Rox as a fighter. She was his main mentor and role model. Now, she would be a virtual god in his eyes. Well, she certainly deserved being put up on a pedestal. I watched as she gave Kenny a warm hug in return, only now with one of the largest smiles I had ever seen plastered on her beautiful face. Okay, everyone. I heard Tom's gruff voice announce. We're gonna fucking celebrate. We've been working our asses off for months, and today was the best victory we've had against the Mortis in years. And I'm just damn glad to be alive thanks to Roxy here. She's the true hero of the hour. I'm going to go down to Hector's Carnissaria and get us some two-inch porterhouses. Let's grill out by the pool. Damn good idea, old man. Steve chimed in. I'll go with you. Only the stakes are on me. All three of you are the heroes today. Tom's face lit up with a large, mischievous smile. Well, I'll be damned. If it took me almost getting killed to see Steve actually coughing up the dough for a meal, then I guess it was all worth it. Let's go, surfer boy. And party we did. Hell yeah, we deserved it. It was evening by the time we had the food and the beer and began grilling out by the pool. The condo had a pool complex that had a couple of gazebos with barbecue grills and tables, as well as a small clubhouse. Steve was put in charge of grilling the steaks. His culinary reputation was legendary from his years of barbecue experience along the top surfing beaches of Southern California. Roxy brought down baked potatoes, deviled eggs, baked beans, and other side dishes we had cooked back in the condo, and Kenny made sure our coolers were kept full with beer, namely my favorite, Henry Weinart's Private Reserve. Kenny had long ago stopped drinking his old brand, Falstaff, and had adopted Henry's as his go-to beer as well. He hadn't yet taken up to using it as a chaser for a chilled shot of peppermint schnapps, but he was still young, and I had plenty of time to keep working on him. Tom plugged in a radio, and we tuned in the FM radio to K-Rock, 
L.A.'s top classic rock radio station. It was a beautiful Southern California evening, and despite the sun beginning to go down, the desert breeze was warm, uh, comfortable against our bare skin. By the time the automatic pool and patio lights came on, the steaks were ready. We all filled our plates and grabbed seats around the tables. Hey guys, I said as everyone sat down. I remained standing and grabbed my cold bottle of Henry's. I'd like to say a few words before we dig into this feast. Tom smiled and he interrupted. Just a few words? He asked. That'll be a first? I laughed and then continued on. Well, maybe more than a few. I just want to say, it's been a long time since we all gathered to just have a good time. Well over a year, I know. I've asked a lot of all of you. I just want to say, Steve, Tom, Rox, and Kenny, you guys are the best damn team of professionals that anyone could ever hope for. You guys fight evil every day, putting your lives on the line every time we go on the road. You see things and endure hardships that most mortal humans should never have to endure. You sacrifice everything for no personal gain or glory. I'm proud of each and every one of you. And most importantly, I'm proud that you're my friends. I raised my bottle of Henry's. Here's to all of you. I love you guys. Fuck yeah. Tom barked, standing up, holding his signature glass of scotch. Neat. Here's the Jack's band of merry men. And, uh, woman. He corrected himself, giving Roxy a sheepish wink. Steve, Roxy, and Kenny all stood up. And as our bottles and glasses clinked together, Steve proclaimed, Hell yeah, it's one for all and all for one. Roxy laughed. Uh, you're mixing up Robin Hood and the Three Musketeers, you morons. And you're just a few hundred years apart. Suddenly, Roxy went rigid. Her expression turned blank, and she cocked her head, like she was tuning into something. I had seen this physical reaction too many times over the years to not know what it meant. Sure enough, moments later, a voice came from off to our left. When I was a small child, we pronounced that little phrase as unus pro omnibus, unus pro uno, our ancient Latin, and which, by the way, has become the unofficial motto of Switzerland. We all turned our heads as Simon walked out onto the poolside. As Simon's familiar, Rox had sensed his arrival without even seeing it, although I had tried hard over the years to not let it get to me. Seeing her reaction every time Simon made his presence still rankled me. It was a constant reminder of her connection with Simon, and that despite her love for me, she was still beholden to him. She was his familiar. I've had to learn to live with it, but damn, it was frustrating as hell. Despite this, over the years, Simon had grown to be my friend and confidant. He had been a close friend of my first love, Bethany. He personally ensured the safety of my mother and younger sister when I became the Mortis's public enemy number one. He had proven to be a man of honor and integrity, and I had nothing but respect for him. I stood up and gave him a hug. As always, he was wearing his professorial corduroy sports coat with the patches on the elbows. His skinny and deceivingly frail frame, together with his shoulder-length curly dark brown hair, his handsome patrician face, framed with his 1960s-style granny glasses, belied Simon's true power and authority as a senior vampire within the Magnus Vampire clan. He looked around my age, yet he was ageless. I thought I'd drop in, he announced with his usual witty sense of humor. I heard you guys had a hell of a victory today. At least 40 dead mortars. That's one for the history books. Yet again, you guys are truly the A-Team. We chuckled at this reference to the popular action-adventure TV show, which had continued for the past five seasons on NBC. Well shit, Simon. I hope I don't look as old as George Pappard. But I do admit I sometimes feel like it. I quipped in reference to the 60-year-old main actor of the show. We invited him to sit down. I knew better than to offer him a steak. He had different tastes. Hello, Roxy. How have you been? He asked. Very good, sir. She replied. As usual, Rox turned overly formal when Simon was around, almost like she was reporting to her senior, which, of course, she was. She had been on her limited sabbatical with us since the Initum Novum, now seven years previous. Simon could have called her back to his side at any time, but he never had. I'm not sure how I would challenge him if he ever did, 
or what Roxy's reaction would be if he did. Perhaps he realized her aptitudes were better left with us. After all, today's results clearly reinforced her importance to the team's success. I'd like to think, though, it was because he knew how much I had grown to love Roxy, and her me. Maybe giving Roxy to me was his attempt to make amends for failing Bethany in her hour of need in her final fight with Alexandria. And for my loss. I might never know for sure. But for now, things remained in stasis, a strange state of the status quo. Jack, you are all to be congratulated. Simon began. Beginning with you, Tom for that superb piece of detective work in ascertaining Tanya's location. Even our own contacts within the LAPD hadn't pieced that together. She had been building that nest for at least two years, and we all failed to see it. It was an intelligence failure, but you figured it out. That was a hell of an investigative coup. I could see Tom puff up a bit with Simon's praise. I felt good for the old detective. He had given up everything. His personal life, his goals, his normal retirement to fight this fight, and I loved him like a father. Simon turns to Rox. And Roxy, well, today you showed all of us that warrior spirit you have inside you, the same one I'd felt so intensely within you when we met so many years ago. Today you scored an exceptional victory against the Mortars, a major blow to Tonya and her evil plans. You are truly the best the Magnus clan has to offer. I've never regretted for a moment leaving you in Jack's care. The Council of Elders has agreed with me. They have instructed me to bestow this honor upon you. Simon stood up, and Roxy followed suit. He pulled out a necklace with some sort of amulet dangling from the chain. It's a simple thing, Simon explained, but it goes back to our earliest times. It's a hollowed-out acorn placed on a necklace. This particular acorn comes from an oak tree on a hilltop outside of Stepach, near Augsburg, Germany. It was at that location several millennium ago that our forefathers held a conclave and made the declaration that they will live amongst the humans in peace and would not feast upon human blood to survive. That declaration signaled the birth of the Magnus clan of vampires, and its tenets remain in effect to this day. One of those original elders was a vampire whose ancient Germanic name had been lost to time, but we knew him simply as Der Eisern or the Iron One. As Kenny learns during his time with us, Darren Isern is considered, well, for the lack of a better term, the patron saint of the Magnus clan. His entire existence was dedicated to enabling the Magnus to fit into human society, and later, battling the disgruntled and disaffected vampire offshoot that became the Mortis. His epic battles to rein in the Mortis threats to humankind are stuff of legends, and lasted over centuries. Despite this, he was caught off guard and killed during the Sanguis Purgationem, or the Blood Purge of 1962, when the Mortis launched their infamous surprise attack on the Magnus clan, killing over 30 prominent Magnus vampires over a three-day period. It was a wake-up call to the Magnus elders that the Mortis had become too well organized and had to be dealt with, and that was when I was put in charge of Committee X our euphemism for the clan's Mortis Eradication Program. The death of their Eisern was a serious blow to our clan, and we all felt like we had lost a father. He was truly a hero to us all. What I have here, Simon said, again lifting up the necklace, is an award given to only the most deserving within the clan, those who have fought the Mortis with the utmost heroism and gallantry. In the acorn, picked from the same group of trees on the same hilltop where the Magnus clan was conceived millennia ago, are some of the actual ashes of Der Eisern. By wearing this, you are recognized as having the same warrior spirit as he had. I had wanted the elders to bestow this honor on you after the Initum Novum at Atlanta, but technically you are not yet of pure vampire blood, and it was not permitted. But I kept working on them. And today, after hearing the news of your latest success, they have granted an exception. So, Roxy, I'm so pleased to now bestow you with this sacred honor. Simon walked over behind Roxy, and as she lifted her mane of blonde hair, he clasped the chain around her neck. We all began whistling and applauding. Way to go, Rox. I congratulate it. That's right, no one deserves it more. Steve second. 
Kicking ass and taking names. I'm so proud of you, girl. Came Tom. Fuck yeah. Opined Roxy's exuberant protege, Kenny. Roxy, never a shrinking violet by anyone's stretch of the imagination, began to blush with all the praise. I went over and gave her a hug. I love you, I whispered in her ear. More than I can say, I'm so very proud of you. As I turned around, Simon was giving me a knowing smile, followed by a wink. Shit, I'd forgotten about the vampire's superb hearing. Just like with the damn bat, a vampire's hearing is exceptional and is more than seven times keener than a human's sense of hearing on the high-frequency scale. Well, I thought, I guess the cat's out of the bag once and for all. An hour later, with our plates clean and drinks in hand, we stretched out beside the pool. Man, those steaks were absolutely delectable, a very contented Tom remarked as he rubbed his portly gut and leaned back in the lounge chair. Steve snickered. Steaks, plural, being the operative word, he pointed out. You sly fox, you knew full well rocks as a vegetarian. You had your dibs on her steak before we had even left Hector's. Steve turned to the rest of us and quipped. Tom thinks he's got the body of a god, only too bad it's Buddha's. Tom looked at Steve, eyes narrowed and shot back. Hardy har har, I happen to do a very good job at watching my weight. That comment elicited a row of laughter from all of us, since we all knew that statement was complete bullshit. Oh, sure, Steve retorted, now obviously on a roll. Why is it then that when you step on your scale it says, one at a time? We all were in stitches with that one, Tom included. I looked around, happy to see the team in such a light-hearted and jovial mood. God knows they all deserved such an evening. A respite, however short, from the evil that would still be there the next morning. Later, after Tom and Steve had left for the clubhouse to shoot some pool, and Rox and Kenny had returned to the condo to take back the dishes, I sat alone on the edge of the pool, my legs dangling in the warm water. As I listened to the water splash against the side, I suddenly had a strong sense of deja vu that flashed through my mind and brought me back to a memory four years previous when I stood near the very same spot and first encountered the newly minted vampire named Tanya. Except that night, the pool and clubhouse were dark and deserted, and Tanya had caught me off guard with her sexual seduction. I had neglected to wear the neck crucifix, now a mainstay of our attire, and Tanya's sexual power had been overwhelming. If it hadn't been for Steve, I'd probably have fallen into Tanya's clutches that very first encounter. But after her initial attack on my family, we'd gotten her on the run. We'd been in hot pursuit ever since, and our patience had paid off. Today we had destroyed her nest she undoubtedly worked years to build, decimating her pack of followers. It was indeed a major victory, but still. As I sat along the edge of the pool, worry had taken infectious root. I couldn't fight back a nagging foreboding, a dark feeling of dread, because of a simple fact. We had missed killing Tanya. I knew Roxy was right. After all, Rox was inherently a fighter, a foot soldier, and she understood the score. She knew that if one is attacked, the best response is to counterattack as soon as possible. Otherwise, risk losing what tacticians call the center of gravity. Without a counterattack, the adversary will maintain the momentum, and thus the tactical advantage. I came to the conclusion that an evil psychopath like Tanya would understand this. She will not sit still. She would be driven by unrelenting revenge and would let nothing get in her way, no matter who she had to use or how many would be killed in the process. I continued to sit there, morose and contemplative of these thoughts, until I realized someone was standing beside me. Hey, buddy. So here's where you've been hiding. I heard a familiar voice say, it was Chris Clark, a fellow condo resident. I looked at him and smiled. Hey, Chris. Grab a Henry's out of the cooler and have a seat. Chris and I had become close friends over the years, bonding over our mutual love for classic cars. He had helped me work on my father's Mustang, and we had often teamed up together to go to many vintage car shows throughout L.A. County. Chris owned several sweet rides, my favorite being his 1957 Ford Thunderbird, 
1965 Pontiac GTO, and a 1970 Dodge Challenger. He could afford his lavish car hobby. Now, in his late fifties and retired, Chris had made great money as a screenwriter for Desilu Productions and its successor, Paramount's Television. Because of his career in the industry, we also clicked over our shared interest in music and film. Chris knew I had at one time attended the UCLA Film School, but he accepted my reasons for why I hadn't gotten into the entertainment industry. As far as he knew, I had some shadowy job with the Department of Defense, a career that explained why I was on the road a lot. Chris never asked questions about my work, and I was grateful for that. He had only come to know that Steve, Tom, Roxy, and Kenny were part of my team. Because of their similar ages, Chris had also become particularly close with Tom. But the bottom line was that Chris did not know what I really did for a living, and that's just the way I wanted it. I wanted some relationships in my life to be simple, and not to be tainted with my crazy life of killing vampires. I watched as Chris took a beer and plopped down beside me. Hey Jack, he started. I just bought a new car, uh, well, not exactly new, a 1984 Pontiac Fiero. You've seen them, a totally innovative design, a mid-engine two-seat sports car. Has a 2.5 liter Iron Duke engine, stick shift, composite skin panels, real sweet, fun as hell to drive. For some reason, Pontiac discontinued them last year, after only four years in production, that big mistake in my opinion. I predicted they'll be highly collectible and a cult classic in a few decades, there'll never be another car quite like it. Come on over sometime and you can take a spin. I told Chris I would. We talked cars for the next half hour, and agreed to attend the LA Auto Show in another two months. All right, kiddo, Chris said as he got up to leave. Tell Tom I said hello, and that I'm in the process of buying a 1969 Plymouth Belvedere. That was the standard for the LAPD back then. If he wants to help me, we can restore it with all the proper police lights and paint job. I told Chris I was sure Tom would absolutely love assisting on that project. Soon after, I bade Chris goodbye and made my way back to the condo. When I walked back in, I found Roxy sitting at the conference table with notes scattered all around her. Jack, she began without preamble. I'd like to go back to the Kohler Street warehouse tomorrow. If the place is not crawling with fire investigators, I'd like to check out a few things. Number one, I remember seeing two or three connexes or shipping containers in the lot behind the building. In our haste to get out of the area, I couldn't take a close look at them. But it's odd, don't you think? For them to have been there when the building had just been sold and was itself still empty? I noticed they looked fairly clean, like they'd been dropped there recently. I didn't see any stenciling for Maximus Enterprises, but that doesn't say much. I took in what Roxy had said, and taking a seat beside her, asked, So you think it's possible Tanya was hiding in one of those? Roxy nodded. Well, if not Tanya, maybe more of her converts, she replied. The containers provide total darkness, that's for sure. It definitely bears checking out. Number two. I want to go back to see if there was any access to the sewer or storm system from around the building or under the storage containers. It's a long shot, but... Roxy's voice trailed off. If there was, then Tanya could have escaped that way. She could still be down in the tunnels. I finished. I had an involuntary shudder, recalling the memory of the last time Roxy had encountered Tanya in a storm system. Okay, but the only thing is, I continued... The site is probably covered with burnt timber and debris. Might be impossible to spot a manhole cover. And, like you said, arson investigators are probably on site today trying to determine the cause of the fire. Maybe we should wait a few days. Roxy shook her head adamantly. No. We need to at least try. I'd feel better looking at those storage containers sooner rather than later. It's not like you have a hot date tomorrow, right? Roxy challenged, smiling. I knew then she was going to go with me or without me. I sighed. Sure. Okay. Let's do it. I said, smiling back. Every day is a hot date when you're around. Only, we're taking the Trans Am. We woke up early the next morning. Kenny had become privy to our plan to return to, in his words, the scene of Roxy's great victory against the Mortis. He desperately wanted to accompany his mentor, but Roxy was firm. Kenny, it's probably going to be a bust. If there are LA County officials on site, we're just going to turn around and come back. It's a long trip, and no use wasting your time. 
Better spend it going over the daily police reports with Tom. Wojciech is still out there, and I know you want to get back on his trail at the first sign of his new whereabouts. Kenny was disappointed, but couldn't argue where his real priority lay. An hour later, Roxy and I were packed up with our go bags and ready to roll. Any problems, give me a shout on the radio, Tom reminded as we headed out the door. It was a beautiful, sunny California day as we got on the 101. Traffic on the freeway was light. I looked through Roxy's cassette box and found a tape. I slipped it into the car's tape player. L.A. Woman by the doors came playing through the speakers. Mr. Mojo rising, gotta keep on rising. Hell yeah, a pure classic by my idol, the Lizard King Jim Morrison. I looked over at Roxy, with her wayfarer sunglasses on and her blonde hair blowing in the wind. She was sexy as hell. You're my L.A. woman, I told her. She gave me a sideways glance and smiled. You're such a goofy romantic, Jack. I laughed. Yep, I said. That's me. Goofy and romantic. And don't forget sexy. It was a few minutes later, as we merged from the 101 on the 405 South, that I heard Roxy say calmly, Hmm. It looks like we're being followed. Don't turn around. There's a white Toyota Corona. 70s model. I noticed it was behind us on Topanga Boulevard, and it followed us on the 101. I couldn't be sure, but now it's on the 405 with us. Could be a coincidence, I said. Roxy nodded. Could be. We'll see how long he follows us. If he's still behind us after a few exits, I'll get off and do an SDR. An SDR, a surveillance detection route, was usually a pre-planned route, but could be done in the spur of the moment. It needs to incorporate several turns in a stair-step fashion, and have a few stops in between, such as at a gas station or a convenience store. Time, distance, and direction, those were the key factors. If at the end of such a route the same vehicle was still following, there could be no doubt that it was purposeful. We continued to drive down the 405 and soon passed the exit for Sunset Boulevard. The next major exit was Santa Monica Boulevard. He moved over a lane, Roxy announced. He's got his turn signal on. Okay, he's getting off. I laughed. We're seeing ghosts, I said. Or getting paranoid. Being paranoid keeps you alive, Roxy replied. We eventually made our way downtown to the industrial district. We again parked on Kohler Street, not far from the now burnt out ruins of the warehouse, but a bit further down the street than we were the day before. Roxy had to parallel park between two other parked cars. Just as she cut the engine, I noticed another car came up alongside ours. Instead of continuing on down the road, it abruptly stopped, right next to Roxy's door, blocking it. I could see the car's power window begin to slide down. Thank God for Roxy's training and instincts. She turned her head, took one look into the eyes of the driver, and within a split second made the decision that saved both our lives. Get down, she yelled, while simultaneously throwing herself over onto me, pushing me below the line of sight from the driver's window. Just as she did, I heard the first crack of pistol fire. I could practically feel the round as it passed just over my head and out of my passenger's open window. Another shot, then another. The front window cracked and spiderwebbed. The rearview mirror shattered. I desperately reached over my head and fumbled for the door handle. Another round hit the door just above my head. I found the handle and pushed the door open. I half slithered, half poured out of the car seat head first onto the sidewalk, pulling the prone Roxy by her long blonde hair. I heard her yelp in pain, but at least I knew she was still alive. Once on the curb, I turned around and got a better grasp on her and grabbed her by her shoulders. Exposed, I heard another crack of the pistol and felt an intense pain in my right shoulder as I was rocked backwards. I had been hit. Blood started coursing down my arm as I reached back and grabbed Roxy again. She had managed to get halfway out, still prone and below the line of fire. I grabbed her arms and continued to pull her out. As I did so, another round narrowly missed my head. I could hear the whistle of the bullets as it passed by. As soon as Roxy was out, she pushed me up against the side of the car and then pulled out her own pistol and began returning fire. The Smith & Wesson Model 645 barred as it let loose a barrage of rounds back at our attacker. Nine shots later, she ejected her empty magazine and was reloading with lightning speed. 
The shooter in the other car let loose with a renewed barrage of his own gunfire, and I could hear the rounds impact the brick wall of the building behind our car. Shards of brick flew in all directions, peppering the back of my head. My right arm was useless, but I managed to pull out my sig and, grasping it in my left hand, moved towards the back of the car. Jack, wait! I heard Roxy hiss as I left her side. She cursed, but kept up her suppressive fire as I crept behind the Trans Am and then up behind the attacker's car. The man had gotten out and was kneeling beside his closed driver's door to shield himself from Roxy's withering fire. He was shooting through his open driver and passenger windows across to our car. His mistake was his tunnel vision, focused solely on Roxy and not taking into account that there had been two of us in the car. My non-shooting hand shook as I tried to steady the gun. By the time he saw me out of his peripheral vision, it was too late. His head turned and I had a moment's look directly into his eyes. They looked crazed, insane even. Before he could swing his gun around, I fired. The sig bucked twice, a double tap, and the guy's head exploded in a red halo. His brains splattered the side of his car, and he fell over lifelessly on the road, face down on the baking pavement. After the crescendo of gunfire, the street was eerily suddenly quiet, save for the residual ringing in my ears. Roxy stood up and ran around the back of our car. Her gun still outstretched, she came up alongside me. When she saw the man was dead, she lowered her weapon. God damn it, Jack, she chastised. That was a damn risky move. I had him pinned down. I looked at her and smiled. I always have your back, remember? No matter what. Roxy sighed. Well, nice headshot, she reluctantly complimented. Pretty good for a left hand, I said. And then Roxy looked down and saw the blood dripping down my right arm. Shit, you've been shot? She exclaimed, her calm and professional demeanor suddenly evaporating. Oh my god, Jack, let me take a look. I held up my left hand. Save it, I'm okay for now. We need to check out that guy's ID before the cops come. I want to know who the fuck he is. I could see workers already coming out of the various warehouses along the street. Soon we were going to have a whole crowd of gawkers and a lot of explaining to do. Roxy went over and picked up the man's weapon that had been flung out of his hand. It was a Walther PPK in 32 caliber, same as Hitler used to commit suicide in his Berlin bunker. Roxy flipped the guy over and found a wallet. Out of state driver's license, Nevada. Antonio Massetti, 44 years old. No other ID, no credit cards. Got a few hundred dollars in cash here. I watched as she pushed the man's hair back, revealing a small tattoo just behind his left ear. Jack, this guy's a familiar. He's got the mark of the mortis. I looked close at the tattoo, which depicted a long, wickedly curved blade on a long handle. It was a scythe, the universal symbol for death and the Grim Reaper. It was also the symbol of the mortis vampire clan. While the Magnus vampires adopted two upward-crossed swords as an expression of strength, gallantry, and readiness for battle, the Mortis chose the scythe, a tool death uses to cut down the living and reap their souls. Roxy stood up. I need to get Tom on the radio, she said. He's gonna have to get a hold of his LAPD contacts, or we'll be at the police station for hours explaining this shootout. And we still have the other problem. I stared at her. Huh? What other problem? I asked. This is not the car that was following us, she replied. I think the other guy was a lookout. Gave the shooter the heads up we were on our way down here. So that means... That means there's still a second guy out there. I finished for her. Yeah, Roxy said. This was a hit set up by Tanya. The bitch wants revenge for what we did to her sanctuary yesterday. Maybe she even figured we might come back here today. Her hit team was ready. It was a poor ambush, though. The guy should have made sure we were boxed in on both sides. Poor ambush? I asked, wincing as I pointed to my shoulder. I would have hated to have seen a good one. A few minutes later, I sat on the curb while Roxy was speaking with Tom from a nearby payphone. Turned out one of Massetti's stray bullets had taken out the radio. Tom would be pissed, I mused. He ended up making it down to the shooting scene in a little under 30 minutes. He must have been pushing pedal to the metal. By the time he got there, I had already been taken to a nearby hospital to get the gunshot wounds treated. 
Roxy stayed behind to give her statement and answer the investigating officer's questions. When Tom got on site, he made a few other calls, and Roxy was allowed to leave. I was told to contact the officers later to leave my own statement. By late afternoon, Tom and Roxy arrived to the hospital. The wound had been cleaned and sutured, and my right arm was in a sling. The doctor informed me that I was lucky. Tanya's would-be assassin was obviously no professional. The 32 ammo he used was considered small caliber with low velocity, and they were full metal jacket rounds vice the more destructive hollow points, which meant little to no fragmentation. The round hit me along the top of the shoulder joint through the deltoid muscles. In and out. Clean shot. If it would have hit lower and nicked the brachial vessels just interior to the armpit, it would have been a whole other story. Hey, kid. Tom growled as he came into the treatment room. You trying to take my crown from the most bullet wounds on this team? Roxy said you were acting like John Rambo. I couldn't help but smile. Seven years ago, Tom Schmidt was my worst nemesis, a suspicious homicide cop on my ass like a bad case of the clap. But now I considered him the father I no longer had. I thanked God for every day I had friends like him. I was tired of Roxy always taking the bullets for me and getting all the attention. I quipped, then winced in pain as I had tried to raise my arm. Roxy looked sideways at Tom and bent over to kiss me, said in her most seductive voice, Okay, stud, let's get you back to the apartment. Mama will make you feel a whole lot better. Roxy's car was still drivable, but she was going to have to get the windshield and rearview mirror replaced, and the doors had suffered a few bullet holes. But overall, not much damage considering the amount of lead that had been flying through it. Roxy drove us over to my apartment in North Hollywood. I had been living there back in 81 when I was attending UCLA, and had first met Bethany, my girlfriend, and Magnus Vampire. After she had sacrificed herself to save me and Steve, I never had the heart to give the place up. Too many good memories, despite the bad, you know. After Roxy moved in with me a few years ago, the apartment had become a refuge for both of us. A place to escape the madness of our chosen profession. A place to forget, temporarily at least. The images of the victims and the carnage we all too frequently had to clean up as we pursued the mortis. A place for just the two of us. When we got in the door, I was feeling woozy. The painkillers and medication were all kicking in strong, and it was all I could do to walk unsteadily towards the bedroom. I didn't even take my clothes off before stretching down on the bed. Despite Roxy's tempting promise to make me feel much better, I drifted off to sleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. The last thing I vaguely remembered was Roxy covering me with a comforter and kissing me on the forehead. I awoke in the dark to a shrill noise. I raised my head, startled. When I did, a wave of pain shot through my forehead. I groaned and set my head back on the pillow. The phone kept ringing like an insistent child. I finally couldn't ignore it. I fumbled for the receiver. I, hello? I managed to croak, my throat as dry as sawdust. Jack, this is Tom. Sorry to call this time of night, but it's important I give Roxy an update. Could you pass the phone over? I looked over at the clock. It was just before midnight. I, uh, yeah, sure, I said, my mind still foggy, not catching on to what Tom was alluding to. I turned back around and only then noticed the bed was empty. Roxy wasn't there. Uh, Tom, I said, uh, Roxy's not in bed. What update? There was a moment of silence, then I listened as Tom swore out a string of curses. God damn it, she said she'd wait. He muttered. Listen, Jack. He said, now with a tone of urgency. I had called earlier this evening and told Roxy what I discovered. I ran that guy's name, the shooter, Antonio Massetti, and discovered that he has a brother here in L.A. Found a local article about a restaurant supply company run by Carlo Massetti. The article stated he has a brother. Antonio, in the same line of work in Las Vegas. I made the connection. But the kicker is, when I looked up Carlo's address, it was right here in the valley. And not just anywhere. He lives in Northridge, Jack. He lives right next door to the former house of Tanya Lieberman's parents. My heart skipped a beat. Shit! I exclaimed. 
That can't be a coincidence. And Rox knows this. Damn it. She must have gone over there, Tom. I'm sorry, Jack. Tom said. I messed up telling her. But listen, the reason I was calling back, Jack, to give Roxy an update. One of my contacts who was checking the L.A. property records for me called a few minutes ago to tell me Carlo Massetti had applied for and received a permit to build a fallout shelter in the backyard of his Northridge home. That was a year ago, so there must be an underground bunker somewhere around the back. I thought about that. A perfect place for a vampire to hang out during the day, I said, and she'll be wide awake right now. Rocks could end up bumping right into her. I've got to get over there. As I reached over to hang up the phone, I could just hear Tom say, I'll meet you there. I ran into the living room, vainly hoping that maybe Rox decided to sleep on the couch so not to bother me. But of course, she wasn't there. I checked, and the keys to the Trans Am were gone. I reached into my pocket for the keys to the Mustang, but suddenly remembered I had left the car over at the Woodland Hills condo that morning. Damn, I thought. No car. Then I remembered Roxy's old car was still here. One of the neighbors was nice enough to let her park it in one of their unused spaces. It was a monstrously large 1979 Chevrolet Monte Carlo. It looked like a pimp car to me, but it was built like a tank. Black in color, just like the one used by Michael Platt and William Maddox during the infamous 1986 FBI Miami shootout that killed two FBI agents and wounded five. I desperately looked for the keys around the apartment, and after rummaging through all of Roxy's belongings, I finally found them, in a pocket in one of her backpacks. Too much precious time being wasted, I thought. Then I realized the go-bag with all my vampire fighting gear was still in the trunk of Roxy's Trans Am, which also included Bethany's sacred dagger. Can this situation get any more fucked up, I thought. In a frenzy, I ran around the apartment once again, looking for whatever I could find. I finally came up with a crucifix and one vial of blessed holy water. It would have to do. At least the shoulder rig with my sig was there when I left it hanging on the back of a chair before I crashed into bed. I quickly made sure it had a loaded magazine and then headed out the door. I got into the Monte Carlo and prayed it would start. I hadn't seen Roxy drive it in ages. Then I looked down and realized that, yes, things could get even more fucked up. Roxy's Monte Carlo was a standard shift. I looked down at the sling which had immobilized my right arm. No choice. I tore the sling off. When I stretched out my arm, pain shot through my shoulder like a hot knife. I reached into my pocket and grabbed the bottle of painkillers they gave me at the hospital. There was some time-release morphine tablets and also some Tylenol codeine. I didn't have time to read the labels with the warnings or suggested dosage. I quickly poured out a few of each, plopped them in my mouth, and chewed them before dry swallowing. Ready to rock and roll, I thought. I pumped the gas pedal several times and turned the ignition. The car's Chevy 305 engine roared to life. It was just after one in the morning as I sped down Victory Boulevard towards the west side of the San Fernando Valley. The road was nearly deserted and I was running way over the 40 miles per hour speed limit. I didn't care. Roxy's life held in the balance. I reached the cross streets of Victory and Van Nuys in record time. No cruising kids on Van Nuys tonight. Just a few determined hookers, their hair blowing in the night's warm breeze. How vulnerable they were, I thought, as I raced by. Easy prey for the sickos and the depraved. The human monsters, as well as those not quite so human. I cut north up Rosita, and in another ten minutes had reached the streets where the Lieberman house stood. The small three-bedroom ranch home was the scene of a bloodbath four years ago, when Tanya had butchered her parents in the most horrific of ways the petulant teenager's payback for a lifetime of kindness and love. Once a bright and caring daughter, Tanya became evil incarnate, one of the undead, and the last thing her parents would have seen was something straight out of hell. Tanya the vampire was a total psycho, and her yearnings for sadism knew no bounds. I had often prayed that her parents' deaths were merciful and quick, but the memory of finding her mother's face in the kitchen blender always reminded me of the naivete of those thoughts. I pulled up on the side of the street, a few houses down from Tanya's. The house had been resold since the murders, of course, after first being inherited by one of Tanya's uncles, but he didn't want to keep the death house for long. For the last three years, it had been inhabited by a young family with two young boys. 
I knew this because Roxy and I had come back from time to time surreptitiously, and always during the daylight hours, so we could check the home's crawlspace. Soon after she was turned, we had found evidence that Tanya had slept there, in the dirt under the house. It's well known that newly turned vampires feel comfortable holding up at venues that they knew or felt comfortable in when they were still alive. But after Tanya left L.A. and we were pursuing her around the country, we saw no need to further check her old home. But now she was back. I had a feeling her new home was right next door at the Massetti house, or more specifically, in the backyard bomb shelter. The streets were deathly quiet. There was only the lonely whisper of the palm trees as they rustled in the breeze of the Santa Ana wind. The street light near the house was out, but the moon was bright and cast its silver glow along the row of homes. I couldn't see Roxy's Trans Am parked anywhere, and that scared me. Did she come here at all? I wondered. It'd be a hell of a thing if she had left the apartment just to go buy some milk at the 7-Eleven. Did I jump the gun coming here? No way to call back to the apartment and see if she'd returned. I debated whether to drive to a payphone when I saw something that negated that idea. Now that I was closer to the Massetti home, I could see from the moonlight that the front door was hanging open. The house was completely dark, and the wide open door looked like a hungry maw with only blackness inside. And I could see there was something, or someone, lying on the porch just to the right of the door. I approached cautiously, holding my sig the best I could in my left hand. When I reached the porch, I could see that the body was a man's. Dark skin, dark hair, and a dark, bushy mustache, all accented by the similarly dark circle in the middle of his forehead. He'd been shot, and with what I assessed as a pretty large round, since the back of his head was missing. I reached down and went through his clothes, looking for an ID. I found a wallet and flipped it open. California driver's license in the name of Theodore Falco. Of course, the same guy who had signed the closing documents for the L.A. warehouse on behalf of Maximus Enterprises. Another of Tanya's familiars. Well, used to be, I thought. Somebody had taken him out, but who? I cautiously stepped inside and felt for a light switch on the wall. I found it and flicked the switch. Nothing. Someone had deliberately cut the power. Again, I wondered, who? I had my pen light, but didn't relish searching the house in the dark. Never mind, I decided. Better to go look for the fallout shelter first. Then I could come back to clear the house. I backed out and made my way off the front porch. I followed the walkway and circled around the side of the house. I found a metal gate. The backyard looked to be fenced off. The gate had a latch, and I was afraid it would be locked, but I was able to lift it, and the gate slid open. I cautiously swung it inwards and took a look around. In the moonlight, I could see the yard was indeed fenced in on all sides with a cinder block wall. To my left, going along the length of the wall, was a flower bed full of hydrangeas. Off to the right looked to be a very large orange tree. The back fence was covered by ten-foot-high bougainvillea vines. The rest of the yard was completely open, filled by a carefully manicured lawn. I didn't see anything that looked to be an entrance to a bunker. I realized I was too far away. I would have to walk the perimeter of the yard to make sure. I started off to my left and checked the flower bed all the way to the back wall. I followed the back wall and was about halfway down when I noticed there was another gate. I discovered that it opened up into a second backyard. This yard was smaller than the first about half the size, and without grass. It looks to have been kept as a large garden. I could see rows of staked tomato vines and a couple of small kumquat trees. I walked around the trees and then nearly stumbled over something hard and unyielding. I turned back around, and in the moonlight, I made out an L-shaped piece of metal. A handle, I realized, sticking up about an inch above the dirt soil. About twenty feet away, and ten feet apart, I could see two pipes with cone-shaped hoods extending up from the ground, which I guessed to be inlets and outlets for the bunker's ventilation system. I had found it, but now that I did, I had a few seconds of indecision. It was the dead of night, the vampire's time. Tanya was probably not even down there. She would be out on the hunt. The time to come back would be in daylight, when she's resting. 
And anyway, my cardinal rule for everyone on the team is to never go into a suspected vampire's lair alone. A lesson learned from my ill-fated encounter with Tanya in Jefferson Park years ago. Tom said he was coming. Where the fuck was he anyway? From Woodland Hills, he was actually closer to this place than North Hollywood. He should have been here already. After another moment, I made the decision to open the hatch. If Tanya was gone, I could still ascertain whether she had been there. If so, I'd get the fuck out and come back in the daylight. Quick in and out. Won't take but a minute. Uh-huh. That turned out to be the fucking joke of the year. How'd that line go from Bob Seeger's 1980 hit, Against the Wind? Oh yeah. Wish I didn't know now what I didn't know then. I grabbed the lever and turned it 90 degrees. I could feel it disconnect from some kind of locking mechanism. When it didn't go any further, I then pulled up on the handle. The hatch opened with a slight whoosh, but the hinges were surprisingly quiet. It locked into an open position at 90 degrees. Reflecting in the moonlight, it looked like a silvery headstone. I took the penlight from my pocket and turned it on, being careful to cup it with my hand so as not to show too much light above ground. I could see a metal ladder going down about 10 to 15 feet. There was no light coming from within the bunker. It looked about as dark and inviting as the entrance to an ancient tomb. I took one last look around, debating whether to go back to the front of the house to look for Tom, then decided against it. The hatch was already open, and I needed to look around now. Tom would find me eventually. With that, I proceeded down the ladder. With each rung I traversed, I could physically feel the change in the air. It became dank and increasingly humid. My nose prickled with the musty, earthy smell of dampness and mold. It was obvious the vampire had never seen the need to turn on the bunker's ventilation system. When I reached the bottom, I immediately scanned the area with the light. It looked to be one large room, and it was empty. However, there was one door on the far wall, so I went over to open it. It was a small bathroom or shower area, also empty. I turned back to the main room. It consisted of two small metal beds, two metal storage cabinets, and a small folding table with chairs. The place was disorganized and messy. The doors to the cabinets were hanging open, and inside I could see a haphazard mix of various rations and medical supplies. The floor was littered with kitchen utensils, a camp stove, some bedding, and a lot of clothing. Both men's and women's. And shoes. A lot of them. Something told me a shitload of people had been down here, but hadn't left. Not as humans, anyway. The beds were a mess, the sheets were for the most part missing, and the mattresses were stained and filthy. As I got closer, I could detect the musty smell of sex. I was repulsed by the odor, but nevertheless willed myself to reach out my good hand to touch the mattress. It was still damp. I was disgusted and quickly wiped my hand off on my jeans. I had found Tanya's private layer of sexual perversion. She had been here, and very, very recently. I had seen enough and turned to leave, but then... In the periphery of the light, something caught my eye sticking out from under the bed. It was dark, and I almost didn't see it. I bent down and pulled it out. It was a book, a huge one, maybe at least four inches thick. The thing looked ancient, like one of the very first bound books you'd see in a museum. The book's thick covers looked to be made of wood covered with leather. The leather was embossed with the words, Liber Sanguinis Fidelis. Over the course of the past several years, my understanding of Latin had become quite good. I translated the title to mean Book of the Faithful Blood. Beneath that was the embossed image of a scythe. There was no doubt about it. The book belongs to the Mortis Vampir clan, and it looked damn important. Two metal scraps and the clasps on the binding held the book closed. It took me a moment to figure out the latch, and then I opened the book. The pages were made of some form of animal parchment, and I had a sickening feeling it might be human skin. The book had a codex binding, with the pages sewn together, the historical ancestor of the modern book. The writing in the book was all by hand, in an ancient Latin script. It was difficult to read, 
but from what I could interpret, the first few pages provided an early history of the Mortis, a virtual who's who of the early leaders of the clan. I spotted Alexandria's name several times in the text. She was definitely a big player in the formulative days of the Mortis. I felt a renewed sense of satisfaction having played a part in her ultimate eradication off the face of the earth. I continued to turn the pages. I came to what translated as some kind of a statement of beliefs or a codified creed of the clan. After that, the remainder of the pages simply contained a list of names. Actually, the majority of the book was dedicated to the listing of names. Of this, the first ten or twenty pages had names only, but on subsequent pages, dates began being written beside them. The earliest dates were in the 1300s in the 14th century. I tried to study the light as I rapidly flipped the pages. The handwriting and type of ink changed over the centuries, but the format remained the same. By the time I reached the mid-20th century, the entries began being written in modern ballpoint pen. I saw a name that I recognized from my history classes. Joseph Force Crater, dated 1926. Well, I thought, the New York State Supreme Court judge that disappeared in 1930. The disappearance that remained one of the most mysterious missing persons cases of the 20th century. I kept scanning down the pages. Another name. John Eric Lake. Date, 1964. Yes, I heard of that one. Sports editor for Newsweek magazine. Last seen in December 1967 in Midtown Manhattan, walking towards a subway to go home. Never seen again. I kept reading. My heart started beating faster as I got near the end. Whatever the book represented, I was going to soon get to the current day. I got to the last used page. I felt unsettled to see there were still several hundred pages left empty for future annotations. I scrolled down the names on the last page. I could see the name Carlo Massetti, the owner of this property. Next to them was the date, August 12th, 1987, a little more than two years ago. A few lines under Carlo's name was that of his brother, Antonio Massetti, our would-be assassin. His date was October 18th, 1987. Five names under his, I spotted Theodore Falco, with the date of July 24th, 1988. The Massetti brothers, Falco. I suddenly realized the purpose of the book. How could I have been so dense? I thought. It was in the title. The Book of the Faithful Blood. It wasn't a book of vampires, I thought. It was a book of the faithful. The vampires' familiars. The cursed book contained the list of Mortis' familiars going back to the dawn of the second millennium. It would be a treasure trove of information. From the book we could identify any current living familiars, and from there track down their mortis masters. I was just about to close the book when I saw the name near the end of the list. For a moment, the name didn't register. It was too out of place, too impossible to believe. My head swam with vertigo and I felt like I had been kicked in the gut. My legs suddenly felt like spaghetti and I collapsed to my knees. Bile rose to my throat and before I knew what I was doing, I was spewing vomit onto the concrete floor. I retched to a point where I could barely breathe. No, 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 I gasped. My hands were shaking as I picked up the book and again looked at the name. I hoped beyond all desperation that I had been wrong, that perhaps it was spelled differently from that of the person I knew, but yet it remained. Staring out at me, from the ancient parchment, as vicious and cruel as a knife to my heart. The betrayal was beyond comprehension. One of the closest people in my life. How had I not seen it? How had I not known? I shakily got to my feet. Suddenly, I heard footsteps behind me. Someone had come down the ladder while I had been losing it. I already knew who it was going to be. Hello, kid, came the all-too-familiar voice. Praying to God for strength, I took one last breath and whirled around to face them. <laughs>